Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode 31 and this is the first episode where I'm actually having a guest. We're going to be talking everything about Court of Calls, uh, Alex Nikolic, uh, and we're going to look through his personal data. Every draft that I had until, well, a couple of days ago is analyzed. Um, all the cards that he played are looked at. Uh, all the picks he made are accounted for. So we're going to basically look at the Neo draft from the perspective of, uh, of Court of Calls and, and his drafting. For those of you that don't know uh, Alex, which I assume hopefully is not many, he's a streamer, uh, part of the Channel Fireball Limited crew, uh, uh, part of the Lords of Limited uh, team that uh, clashes against the resources. Uh, he also streams, has a podcast, Limited Level Ups, which is, well, um, without... Uh, without uh, putting too much honey on him, uh, is <laughs> definitely one of the best uh, limited podcasts there is. He is described by many, including me, as the best card evaluator in the game. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see uh, Kamigawa from the perspective of the whole format through the, through the lens of his data. Um, and I always start with the preamble, uh, but because I have a guest today, I'm going to make it very, very short. But there is a big difference when you look at the personal data as opposed to when you look at the 17 lens normal data. Because personal data can tell you what your personal strengths and weaknesses are. And especially personal data can tell you where you differ from the rest of the players, uh, for the good or for the bad. And uh, I think that um, this is also a trial run. Uh, we're trying to look at which data might be useful to present for the average 17 lens user and, and, and maybe do something about it in the future for the future sets where you could trace your own personal data and compare particular metrics with the rest of the uh, 17 lens users. Uh, I see, so, um, so I'm, I'm a guinea pig then today. <laughs> yeah, sort of, sort of, but um, we won't sacrifice you at the end of the experiment like they do with guinea pigs. So uh, rest assured there. Oh, thank you, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that, that that's fine. Um, so yeah, basically, um, I actually wanted your perspective, Alex, because you know, I'm the data guy, I mean, allegedly, but what are you hoping to get out of this uh, seminar? Yeah, so I mean, uh, broadly speaking, I think I'm most interested in, you know, often content creators talk about, you know, myself included, talk about how 17 lane data, you know, you, I should actually point out, you are the person that I think uh, implanted this idea into most of our heads that 70 lands data, when you look on the website, is aggregate data. It's very much what the average player is doing. Uh, it takes in a wide swath of players and it kind of you know compresses it in a way, right? And what gets lost in the mix there a little bit is some maybe new strategies or some cards that are being maximized on in certain ways or maybe some cards that people are missing on, uh, using them in the correct way. And I'm hoping maybe uh, it, when looking at some personal data of, you know, myself or, you know, as you said, in the future others, you can kind of maybe get into uh, this player has figured out a card and a way to use it uh, in a way that the, you know, aggregate player base has not done. Uh, and I think that is probably the biggest thing, because especially when I'm talking to people in chat about why I like a card or why a card I think is worse than people think, uh, the immediate, uh, you know, feedback is, oh, but 70 land says X. And I am a huge believer in, trusting the aggregate data uh but at the same time i know just in my heart of hearts or at least i think so there's going to be you know local maximums that certain players are going to be able to maximize on that won't be shown in that aggregate data so hopefully that's something in there <laughs> yeah are, 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 are you are you getting are you ready for being surprised in some aspects i mean uh, I, well yes something that you didn't expect yeah, I mean, well, that's another thing I was going to say. I, you've been kind of uh, hinting that I'm going to be surprised and there's going to be some interesting things in here. And I, I'm I'm hopefully uh, happy, pleasantly surprised, but I'm also really excited to, you know, maybe eat some humble pie in some areas if that's, if that's what it comes down to. <laughs> I don't think that you're going to... I mean, I, I, I prepared it carefully not to, uh, not to basically thrash you on anything. <laughs> and also, I mean... We look at your data and it's so impressive that uh, it's hard to thrash someone with that kind of win rate, uh, especially when you look at the details of where that win rate comes from. Yeah. Uh, but I think that you might be surprised about your intuitive evaluation of the card and the actual performance in at least couple cases. Yeah, for uh, sure. In both directions also. So uh, 
yeah, let's let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is just to give you all the numbers um, that I uh, have the data for. So basically, it spans from the 10th of February to the 4th of April. Uh, so it's almost completed uh, your uh, uh, Kamigawa set. Unfortunately, we miss out on the uh, speed run because that data <laughs> would have been uh, interesting. There's only two drafts from the speed run that made the data set. But it's, it's 1,071 games, which is quite impressive, uh, over 155 drafts. You have drafted 6,967 cards in that time. And you had a win rate of 63.6 .6 and 83.6% .6 of all your games were in Mythic. Hmm, so uh, I didn't calculate how many of them were against the Mythic players, but it should be very uh, similar. Right. And you have drawn, uh, well, a whole uh, slew of cards. Uh, I calculated it uh, at around 34 kilos if you play that in paper. That's not counting. <laughs> wow. That's not counting sleeves. I think with sleeves it will be closer to 120 kilos of lifting of paper Holy. if you if you wanted to play that kind of uh, amount of games uh, not online. Um, <laughs> I thought that this is a good statistics of measuring how many cards you do uh, because those numbers are just too big to uh, to look at them. Honestly, I think this is a uh, you know an un un uh, you know uncharted area for a player evaluation we should be measuring how everybody's uh number of cards drawn and drafted based on you know just weights that's that's a good metric i think to, to go by <laughs> well it makes you think uh, how, how much you're stockpiling when you're a paper player and yeah have, like, those boxes and boxes of thousands of cards in them um <clears throat> but okay uh i decided to divide it into uh two portions so first we're going to focus on the draft portion and i'm going to be talking about well Actually, you're going to be talking. I'm going to be presenting the numbers, and you're going to be talking about your most drafted cards. Um, and um, cards that made the deck most, I think that this is uh, something that... Sorry, I'm just correcting some small thing. Um, cards that you drafted, and every single time you drafted them, you also played them. Uh, because I think that this is important, like, where were the cards that your pick was extra powerful? Because if you draft something and um, and you play it 50% of the time, you can count it as a half of a good pick. But if you draft, if you play it like 80, 90% of the time, it becomes much more valuable as a card for you. Right. Um, and then we're going to look at the cards that uh, you, you most frequently taken when you saw them, which also tells you something about your preferences in the mm -hmm. draft uh, and, and color preferences. And um, we're going to look at the cards that you never played also. That's going to be like a small addition and the percentage of you playing the first pick. Uh, because um, I did this data on totality of the 17 Lens players, and uh, I would be uh, interested in your perspective of where do you think you are on that scale. Yeah, for sure. Right, so what do you think? I mean, this is the statistics that you can actually uh, access from 17 Lens, so maybe you have uh, sneak peeked uh, what, uh, what you picked the most. And I have two categories. First is commons, and the second one is uncommons, because obviously these ones are going to be more determined by preference. Rares are going to be more, more, um, you know, the result of opportunity, because you even with your amount of drafting, you will not see every rare so many times. So right. So, what's my most drafted common? You want to start yeah. there? Yeah, <laughs> I think that we started commons. Yeah. Okay. So, so just yeah, you know, full disclosure. I actually haven't checked my uh, most drafted cards recently. Uh, so that is something, no, it is kind of in the dark. So I, I would guess, so often most drafted commons are cards that, you know, are, you value a little bit higher than the community, but often not the actual best of the best cards. Cause it's just hard to get all of the, you know, best commons all the time. Although maybe, maybe I'm just more likely to first pick a common than the average player. They might be more willing to pick uh, a rare that they might think is better than the common, but I'm just going to take that Okiba Reckoner rate or whatever, so I end up with more of them. But with that thought in mind, I would guess, you know, if I had to guess, like, top three, I, I would say, like, I draft a lot of black and red, so maybe, like, Okiba Reckoner raid. Uh, Tawashi Song Shaper uh, feels to me like one of the ones that I, I take reasonably early, but also I get on the wheel a lot, so I want to say that's in there. And maybe like experimental synthesizer as well. So those, I, I would, I would gamble those three. Okay, that's a that's that's a good one. Um, 
So let's take a look. I mean, Okiba Recon Array, you're bang on, and the synthesizer, you're bang on. Nice. So Washi Song Shaper is not far, but you forgot about the virus beetle. Of course, of course. Yeah, I should I should have thought of that one. <laughs> and there, there is a good reason maybe why you had the impression that you uh, draft the Washi Song Shaper uh, more, and we'll get to that later. But uh, I mean, when you look at this list, it's just uh, cards that either are super powerful in the one archetype, like the Washi Song Shaper, um, but the rest of them are just very strong cards that maybe were uh, at different stages of the format underpicked by the general population uh, mm. and had a pretty low ALSA for, for the power that they represent. I mean, Okiba Reckoner Raid, full disclosure there. Um, I don't know if you saw my analysis of the pack collation in Arena that I made uh, very timely in the last week of the format, but common sagas are slightly more common than the commons. So you will see more of them on average per, uh, per pod, which right. might explain this extra couple of Okiba Reckoners, right? But still, there's a clear preference for that card. Anything that on that list that surprises you? Uh, I mean, not uh, not hugely. I, I do take the Modern Age, which is the fourth one here, pretty highly. Imperial Oath, I not surprising, but I know for a while, even after you know people figured out this card was awesome, I feel like I take it lower than most people like i know it's a good first pick for most people I, I tend to take it more in the fourth area or fourth range if i'm going down a green or a white path um so that one is probably uh, i would even guess pro i draft it lower than i should um the other seek uh surprise a little bit is uncharted haven where not that i am surprised that i take it highly i'm just surprised other people in relation to you know where i take it don't take it as highly and i end up with this many so yeah, that's that. That is a surprise as being on the top ten here for me. Are you surprised by any absentees on that list? Ah, oh, good question. Um, so I mean, I don't think so because what to me this makes sense as these are the cards that throughout the format I've been drafting pretty much at the same rate. Like there's cards like Kami Flare and Voltage Surge, which I take pretty highly now that I didn't take highly before. So it makes sense if we're taking into account all my data. Um. Trying to think of other cards on this list that might uh, be surprising. I'm not really surprised that there's no green cards here, honestly. Like that, that doesn't shock me at all. I don't tend to take green commons very highly. They kind of just fall into my lap. Uh, maybe like Twisted Embrace potentially, but then again, that's like the one of the I think maybe even the highest drafted common if I remember correctly. Um, so maybe that doesn't surprise me. So nothing sticks out as like, oh, I why is, maybe you have one in mind that uh, you know you're thinking of, but. No, no, I, I don't have a card in mind. I just like noticed that there's complete absence of any removal. And I know that yeah. Twisted Embrace was not far on that list uh, in terms of uh, how it aligned. So um, it was probably like, you know, two, three spots lower than, than the cutoff on the graph. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is there is zero removal. Uh, that was the only observation this I made. It was like main, mainly creatures, sagas, and some card advantage. And I like think it makes of... a lot of sense because looking at the top drafted commons, like the average last seen at, on 17 lands this is true for all formats usually but they're they're mostly all removal spells at the top so relative to where other people take them i take them lower which you know it makes sense with my preferences i think <laughs> yeah you will see you will see many fewer of them okay uncommons come on all right uncommons uh <clears throat> i'm gonna shoot high here i'm gonna say i'm gonna hope that life of tashiro is uh up there um let me think once i draft super highly that maybe other people don't uh Probably not any red ones because they've probably got that voltage surge commie flare thing where I, I take them a little bit later. Uh, I don't think it's going to be green on commons that highly because, I, again, I, I take those a little bit later than most people. So it's like uh, Nazumi Prowler actually maybe stands out to me. The 3-1 uh, ninja as a card that I take pretty highly and I think get, I get pretty late. So maybe that's it. So like Life to Shiro, Nazumi Prowler. Oh, Grave Lighter. Uh yeah, I think I think all black cards that are, are popping them into mind. Let me think of any white, anything white. Uh, no, I don't think so. Mm, if I had to say something that's not black, maybe a a blue card like a Prosperous Thief or a Ninja Lord. Oh, I guess gold cards. Let's think of gold cards. What are the gold cards that take highly? Uh, the Ninja Lord. That's certainly one. Uh, red. Uh, there's not really many red gold cards they take. Prodigy prototype might be up there. Maybe I'm just completely off on these ones. I have a, a much better sense of commons than I do with the uncommons. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm completely off on these. And it makes sense because the numbers on the commons are so much higher that you will just, you know, you will remember those decks that you had five copies of uh, Okiba Reckoner Raid. No, but let's let's take a let's, let's take a peek. Yeah. Nice. At least you <laughs> nailed it with the life of Toshiro. Nice, nice, nice. And actually, I mean, it, it, 
there is this smelter. I think that you forgot about Kumano faces Kakazan. That is true. I did. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, I mean, we, we well, we see one sort of removal in Twin Shot Sniper, but uh, it's mainly creatures. Mm -hmm. Any any big surprises here? Uh, let's see. So big surprises here. No, I think I'm I'm surprised that Besaju is as high as it is. I mean, I took this card highly early on, and you know, definitely for enjoyed a good week or two of getting this past late to me, but I'm surprised it still makes the top 10 based on where I take it now, which is pretty like, I'll take good red and black cards over that most of the time early in the, on the pack. So that surprises me a little bit. Um, long reach of night, I guess, no, maybe not surprising, but I, I guess that falls into my lap because that's a card that I think I value just higher than most. I, I will say maybe said Kenzen Smelter. I wouldn't have guessed that as third. I thinking about it, it makes sense when you put it in front of me, but I don't think that would have sprung to mind as a card I would have guessed in the top 10. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing that you can see is that you have, like, a, this, this clear drop-off from the top five or so on commons, and then, and then if I remember, this tail continues to be around 30, and there you will have your Nazumi Prowler as well, which I remember was quite high because I was mightily surprised that it was that high. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, I don't watch all the streams, but, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's move further. Uh, so, which cards do you think made your decks most percentage of the time? And we're talking about cards that were drafted more than 20 times, because otherwise we go into the realm of like, yeah, you drafted AO three times and you played it three times. Yeah. Right? And that's actually a statistic that is true. Weirdly, the red mythic dragon you drafted eight times and you only played it four. But really? we're talking about cards that you drafted more than 20 times. So there will be some rares. Um, there will be uncommons and commons, almost all of them. Okay. So I, I would think that, again, I'm going to go to the black cards because when I pick black cards early, it's likely that I remain in black for the duration of the draft because uh, black tends to be fairly deep and I am more likely to be able to play those good black cards I have early. So I'm going to guess Okiba Reckoner Raid, uh, Twist and Brace, Virus Beetle are going to all be up there. I would also say probably red cards too, because often what happens is uh, it, it is hard to get me off of red cards, at, even though at Sushi points uh, you know away from that direction, because once I draft red cards early, it's almost the opposite of the black cards in this format, where the black cards, I stay in that color because I, I have the flexibility and I'm going to be able to pick up a bunch of playables. Red is almost more of a necessity. I need to stay in that color or else my red deck isn't going to be very good. So I'd probably say, uh, you know, Synthesizer's in there, the Song Shaper, maybe Voltage Surge, Kami Flare. Um, what else? Uh, are we... Out Oh, I would, yeah. if, if, if I would be like give you a small hint, I would think all about uncommons much more because you're probably more likely to almost always play the uncommons. This is true. This is true. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking common. So let's say also some of the best sagas. So Behold and Life of Toshiro. Circumender almost certainly. Circumender has to be at, one at the top of the list, right? Like I, I, I draft that card. I'm always going to play it. There's no way I'm not playing that card. Searchlight Companion actually might make that list as well. And then um, my the gears are turning. Colorless cards, good colorless cards, probably make a lot of sense there, right? So yeah, Circumender, uh, uh, Surge Hacker Mech, the the vehicle. I, I've drafted that card a lot, I know, and that will always make my deck the five five vehicle. So those are my guesses. <laughs> okay, let's see. Ah, there, there we go. <laughs> there's a, but did you know that you played every single grave lighter that you drafted? Wow. Yeah, that surprises me. I didn't know that. And I haven't I haven't drafted or played every single life of Toshiro. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I think that twice you didn't play it out of the 54, if I remember correctly. This list actually surprises me a little bit because I have we've got uh a Suze's many journeys there as one of the top cards. Uh <laughs> number five here. That's that's uh yeah, that is a surprise to me. Oh, that, that 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 card might surprise you, yeah. Uh, but you do <laughs> have the <laughs> twisted shadow. embrace. Oh, there was the Nazumi Prowler. Every single, almost every single time you drafted that card, you played it. So um, uh, it was definitely here on the list. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. Yeah. This is this, and and you know what? Actually, the green cards. There's more green cards on this list than there were on the previous list, and I think that makes sense to me because I only go into green when I have a good reason to, and I'm likely to play those good green cards where I. I uh, am less likely to speculate on them and then not play them, right? So when I draft them, I think they'll end up in my deck more often. So it makes sense there's a lot of green cards here to me. Yeah, I mean, for me, the big surprise on the list was Jukai Preserver. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, that's, that's way up there. It's ninety one percent. But I, 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 so I mean, I, I didn't look like at, at the time frame of those, but uh, I, I would assume that probably you played them early in the format, and then you just maybe slightly window green. Yeah, I would say so. Same thing, like I was saying before. So it, it's it's likely that a lot of the chunk of you know the chunk of where the numbers from the screen cards is coming from is from first two or three weeks, I would say. Yeah, but um, just to give a small update to the people that listen to this in the podcast version, we got two cards that uh, Alex played 100% of the time, and that's Circuit Mender and Gravelighter. And then there is a whole bunch that are between 95 and 90% in Life of Toshiro, Fade into Antiquity, Azusa's Many Journeys, Rabbit Battery, Searchlight Companion, Master's Rebuke. Um, and here we actually see a, a bunch of removals. So we see Kami's Flare, Twisted Embrace, um, Master's Rebuke, um, and fade into antiquity, which is sort of a removal, and that I think shows that you don't draft a lot of removal, but you prioritize it quite highly. And when you do it, you you know that you're in a particular color. You don't want to pick removal for the sake of being in a color. You sort of maybe try to pick it when you already know which color you are, and then you pick the right removal for your deck and you play it. That lines up a lot with my intuition, where I uh, honest often. I'm not getting into a color because of a removal spell. I'm getting in for a rare or a good creature in common or a good creature, you know, a saga or something at common, even like a keep reckoner rate or something like that. So yeah, that, that, that does make sense to me. All right. Let's see what we have next. Ah, yes. The never bees. <laughs> Which cards that never made your deck did you draft the most? Oh. And I think that there's eight of them. Wow. On the common level, I mean, like on the on the level of uh, more than twenty. I think okay. So let me think of it. This I'm thinking the last pick. So uh, dramatist puppet would make sense to me as you know the two four artifact creature. As much as I would like to have found a deck where it was good, I I don't think I ever did. Uh, so that's probably one up there. Uh, I know I've played thundersteel colossus. Oh, uh, the six six vehicle, the six six blue vehicle that that probably is in there as well probably the fact some... that you don't know the name of it after playing <laughs> exactly yeah, 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 yeah. I, tell I, something. I know it's some sort of pr prototype i don't know <laughs> um maybe regents authority the plus two plus two combat trick i don't tend to play combat tricks very often in my white decks i have played like the way though so i know i know that's not there um uh, I think I've played most of the red cards. Actually, Explosive Entry. I, we were just talking about this on the stream. Explosive Entry, the Artifact Destruction card. I have not named that card, I don't think. So that that probably doesn't make the deck. I'm trying to think if there's any true unplayables. Uh, Mech Hanger. Mech Hanger is probably in there. I don't think I put that card in my deck. The uh, the Other Land, the uh, Courtyard. Don't think I put that card in my deck. Uh, those are, yeah, I think I think those, those are the okay. ones that are i can think of <laughs> i mean i think that you made some very decent guesses there but you didn't guess the top one which was crackling emergence. Crackling i'm surprised i haven't played that card actually <laughs> not once not even wow. once or maybe maybe you did but you never logged it into 17 lands so that's yeah. a possibility but the card that surprised me was guardians of oboro because i think that, that that card is fringe playable in particular decks it's just I don't know. Maybe you you played your decks that would actually host it well uh, early in the format, and then late in the format when you would have known how to use it better, you just weaned off those type of decks. I think so. Yeah, I I, I agree. And like, and the other thing too is often when I'm drafting blue, I'm drafting it more tempo-y, aggressive with ninjas and stuff like that. Whereas I can't remember the last time I drafted Simic, right? Whereas the kind of the home for it, it's a defensive blue card. Um, maybe in a blue white deck, you could even make make a case for it which I, you know, I've drafted that actually quite a bit. Blue White has been one of my favorite decks lately. Um, but yeah, I think exactly what you're saying, what it comes down to is if there was a place, it would have been earlier in the format. And now I probably just pick up better cards uh, or I know which cards that would want to make, uh, put it put it into a controlling shell. And it's probably not, you know, that's not at the top of my list. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so just for the podcast listeners, the number one was Crackling Emergence with 45 tries but zero uh, successes to, into making the deck. And then you have Dramatis Puppets, the card that you guessed, Guardians of Oboro, they are around 39, 37. And Akironin, Reckoner Shakedown, Short Circuit, Heir of the Ancient Fang, Spell Pierce. So you just, I assume that you didn't play Spell Pierce just not to be paired against Ben and to shatter his dreams. 
Yeah, yeah, um, I, I didn't uh, plan for the 0.0001 percenter of being mashed up against Mr. Metronome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Aki Warpaint and Kindled Fury. So like a bunch of red cards that look aggressive, but just didn't fit into your idea of how aggressive red looks like in this format. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty interesting. And I was guessing a lot of uncommons, but it makes sense that I'm, you know, it, it is, there's mostly commons here. You just don't get the density of uncommons generally. But yeah, that's actually what you mentioned is a very good point where, uh, I don't know, even I'm trying to like find a last playable in my red deck sometimes. And somebody will go like, oh, do you like Aki War Paint or Kindle Fury? And I just go, I, I would rather play a basic land over those. Or, <laughs> really, or, or like, Crackling Emergence. Or I Crackling mean... Emergence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but the lack of playing of Crackling Emergence might explain some data later. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we talked about cards making your deck, but there is also the idea of some cards you will almost always pick. Mm -hmm. And which cards you think you have taken almost every time you saw them, and you have to have seen them over 50 times. So we're yeah. talking commons and uncommons here. My most taken cards. Okay, uh, so... I feel like I've seen Life of Toshiro more than fifty times. I think I think I slammed that. I don't think I've ever. No, well, I think we I've, know that you. We know that you drafted it fifty-four times, so yes, I can safely true. assume that you've seen it more. That than is 50 true. Times. <laughs> I don't think. I think I've passed that card. I, I want to say like ten times. I guess we'll actually see potentially. So I'm gonna say Life of Toshiro. I'm going to say Okiba Reckoner Raid. Uh, I'm gonna say Virus Beetle. Again, like, all these black cards. They're just. They're just. You know. They're, uh, they feel like home to me. They feel very safe. So um, just to give you the background, the yeah. first graph is going to be top 10 uncommons plus any commons that makes it into that uh, uh, level of, of, of being picked. And the second draft is going to be only commons and top okay. commons. So maybe great. you can focus us on the on the commons for the first round. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so let me just think. Um, I feel like even though I have drafted less green as the format has gone on, I think I've taken on my fair share. Oh, I, I guess that maybe might not make sense because I, I I would have seen. I was gonna say Tech Wrecker or Blossom Prancer, but I probably at this point passed more of those than I have taken, or at least it's somewhere evened out. Um, Behold the Unspeakable, actually, probably I, I don't pass that card very often. I think I think that would be uh, one at the top of my list there. So you know, another Saga, of course. Um, let me think. Komodo Capaces Kakazan. I take that card all the time. I think that's probably one on the list there. Mm, I, I want to say grave later I, I definitely know i take that card probably a little bit too highly honestly um twin shot sniper that sounds like one i i would tend to take a lot uh and then let me give me let me give one one more guess in there circumender i think circumender is probably a, a good one too hard to okay yeah and that, that that makes absolute sense okay yeah. so let's look at look at through the prism of that guess and boom, 80% of the go. time you took uh, Life of the Shiro. So if we do the back of the envelope uh, calculations, 50 is 80%, so uh, divided by 4. Yeah, you passed maybe like 13 times or so. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, second of all the cards is still Okiba Reckoner Raid, yeah. which just shows <laughs> you how high you were on, the, uh, on those Okiba Reckoner Raids. Uh, like, you picked it more frequently than Brossom Prancer. And you were right, there is the Circuit Mender and Behold the Unspeakable. Uh, the problem with Circuit Mender, obviously, is that you will not see it very late, which mm -hmm. means that it will very often have to compete with a rare. So uh, that's probably the reason why it's not picked uh, higher than that. And as probably as much as Life of Toshiro Umezawa wins with most of the rares in terms of priority and picking, then uh, Circuit Mender will lose to some um, middle of the range rares, I guess. Uh, that's why it's lower. I'm seeing, uh, looking at these these cards here. I'm seeing I'm I'm falling victim to recency bias a bit because I was like, oh, I probably have passed enough, uh, you know, Vasejus and Tech Wreckers and Blossom Prancers, and then I was like, oh no, I don't pass Kamanos. But I, I thinking back, I know I passed a lot of Kamanos at the beginning of the format, and that's way it's lower. Still, on it's the still list. It's, it still makes the list. Though. It does uh, make the list, yeah. But the other green the green cards are are quite a bit above it. Yeah, that's true. But uh, yeah, so we have uh, the top cards uh, that uh, Alex picked uh, um, most uh, frequently in terms of how many times he saw it and how many times he picked it. Life of Toshiro, Okiba Reckoner Raid, Blossom Prancer, Behold the Unspeakable, Circuit Mender. So all the cards that you guessed, really. Then we have Bosiju Reaches Skyward, which I guess is uh, from the early part of the season. Twin Shot Sniper, Kappa Tech Wrecker, Long Reach of the Night, Virus Beetle. That's the second common that makes this list of the top, top cards that you pick. Sokens and Smelter, Twisted Embrace, Mishiko's Reign of Truth, Kumano Faces, Kakazan, and Nazumi Prowler. 
So now the next slide will be commons. And of, obviously we know some of them already because we do know Twisted Embrace, Virus Beetle, and Akiba Reconer Raid. Also all of them black, which again, another hint on your preferences in this <laughs> format. What do you think is behind those? Okay, so behind that, if I'm trying to learn from my mistakes a little bit of this last one, I, I might, I'm, I'm trying to conjure the green cards uh, to mind and see and think if there's any ones that I was early on really high on taking. I, I actually don't think so. Maybe, maybe I would still say, you know, I, I probably passed enough green cards that maybe they don't make the very top of that list. Uh, let's say I'm going to be generous to myself and hope that Imperial Oath is somewhere up there. Um, I think, Maybe Kami's Flare and Voltage Surge, like the red removal spells. Um, uh, the Synthesizer, probably up there as well. Uh, let me think of some other, you know, blue cards. Oh, blue cards are probably up there too with Network Disruptor and uh, Modern Age, I, I would say yeah, that there. Maybe say Network Hack or sorry, uh, Moon Circuit Hacker as well. I, th I think that's a. Okay, that's a uh, well, let, 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 let's see. Let's see where it goes. So I think I don't remember the data, but with synthesizer, the problem is that uh, you probably try to table it. Uh, That's true. Uh, quite quite frequently, and maybe they don't they don't always come back. Although they do come back frequently enough. So let's see. Okay, so we have the first three uh, that were there before. You have the modern age, as you said, imperial oath, experimental synthesizer, searchlight companion. I don't think you mentioned, but. Um, well, it's a colorless card, so you will pick it probably frequently because it um, it doesn't make you uh, uh, define any color, so you can just basically stay open while you do yeah. it. Uncharted Haven, which is not surprising, judging by uh, how many times you drafted it, uh, that you pick it quite high, because I know that you do value a good mana base. This is true. <laughs> uh, then we have Kami of Terrible Secrets. Uh, well, that fits with the black theme. Mm -hmm. Spirited Companion, just because it's a purely good card. Yep. Moonsner Specialist, Moon Circuit Hacker, Network Disruptor, a very nice uh, ninjutsu package there in, in, in one go. A season of Renewal, uh, you didn't mention this one. Ah, oh, yeah. That's an interesting one. I, I That is the one green card that makes this top top list here, right? I think there's no other ones. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, What do I say about that? I guess that's probably, in my mind, the most important common, the, mo the, the most important slash least replaceable common to the green decks. And I know if I don't end up with a season at the end of my draft, my green draft, I'm pretty sad. If I don't end up with two, sometimes I'm sad. So I think it would make sense to, for me to say, well, I know once I'm green, I really, really prioritize that card. So yeah, that that's where I'm you know, kind of logicing this out <laughs> a little bit. But that, that, that's my sort of approach that I noticed that any deck that I have played that had green and did not have the capability of doing the season of renewal thing in one way or another was just ran out of steam at some stage. Yeah. And I think that this card is just so pivotal for the how the archetype tries to function. Also, I am I mean not shocked. Shocked is not the right word, but it is uh it is funny just just how far Okiba Reconorade is in the lead here, right? It's just like the 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 plot for Okiba Reconorade is just massive next to the virus. Oh, yes, yes. The next one, right? <laughs> so to the listeners, uh, Okiba Reconorade, Alex picked this almost 70 times. I'm not going to go for the low uh, hanging fruit of comedy there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the second common uh, virus beetle is around 50%, and then it slowly drops off to 30% or 28, something like that. So the difference between Okiba Reconer Raid and Virus Beetle is just, it's a cliff. Yeah. Which is funny because they're pretty close cards. I do, you know, if I had to take one today, you say, you ask me which one is better, Alex. I say Okiba Reconer Raid, but in my mind, they're not that far apart. So it's just interesting. I, I wonder if that in, means in, in your mind, maybe not, but in your clicking pattern. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, th this is the part where I think looking at the data can give you a slightly different perspective on yourself because. Our brains are by far not perfect uh, devices, and we remember things very uh, fuzzily. You know that you prefer Okiba Reconer Raid, but uh, but then if you actually see the numbers, you will maybe notice just by how much you yeah, prefer that card. Exactly. Yeah, that's wild. Okay, let's move to the next categories. So here I'm going to take a brief, give you a bit of a breather, and I'm going to explain why the least taken card is very important, because. We never focus on what you take the least, but you have to think about it, how the mathematics of the uh, draft works. If there would be a card 
that would say, if you pick that card during the draft, you lose the draft, it would be always a last pick. <laughs> but quite ironically, you would pick it around 12.5% of the time. Because in every pack that you open, it's, it's open, it will be a last pick. Therefore, someone would be just unlucky and would get the card. And uh, because there are eight drafters around the table, like one eighth of the open will go to a particular player. Which means that 12.5 is the baseline uh, for last picks. And actually, I looked at the data. And if you look at the basic lines, which will be usually, but surprisingly, not always picked as last. They are around 12.5. Actually, in your data, uh, the basic lands were around 12.5% of the time. So you pick them when you have to. Makes sense. But if you pick a card at 1% of the time, it means that other players at the pod value the card, but you don't. So these are the cards that particularly show your lack of preference for certain cards. It means that your evaluation of the card is dramatically lower than the evaluation of the card on every other player on the arena that you play against. So that's why I wanted to uh, ask you, which cards do you think you almost never pick even though you saw them? Which means that the pod will pick them, but you won't. As a class of cards, I know it's the aggressive white cards. It's got to be that. It's got to be like the uh, Moth Rider Patrol, Seven Tail Mentors, Imperial Subduer, Aganja, like all the Samurai white cards that, you know, I like, I don't mind drafting white. I just don't. I just think you should almost never put those aggressive white cards in your deck because the, the the deck just doesn't function. It, it doesn't make any sense, really. So that would be as a class of cards, all of those. I like befriending the moths. Another one. Um, I would also maybe put in that like bad removal. So like debt to the kami. Uh, I I would imagine people might take that a little bit higher. Um, even something like I don't know. I, I know I'm not, the medium removal. I probably take high enough. Like I'm thinking like intercessors arrest, but I probably take that high enough where it, it, it doesn't show uh, too much in the data, but that's my big, uh, Oh, mirror shell crab is probably another one somewhere in there where I know people, uh, you know, always want me to be like, take the mirror shell crab as like, Oh, this is a fine card. And I don't hate it so much, but uh, it's definitely one that I shy away from more often than I think m most other people do. So that's my, it's my big picture guess. You know, I spent half of my format trying to live the mirror shell crab uh, of salvage. salvage dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, let's see. So the the least card you pick is actually acquisition octopus and cover technician, and I think nice. that this is this is also symptomatic of a particular uh, style of a card uh, because these two would sort of technically fit in the same kind of blue uh, non ninja aggressive deck, and you never you didn't play those decks that much, I guess. Yep. Actually, Acquisition Octopus, you picked it, I think, once and you played it zero times in the whole format. Because this I know because sense. this is the first card alphabetically in the data sets. So I always have to analyze everything through the lens of the Acquisition Octopus. And normally I look if the numbers in the formulas that I write show up. And for this, it was always zero, which I made me suspicious. So I had to copy it to the next column to see if the next column works, which yeah. was quite frustrating. So please play more uh, Acquisition Octopus <laughs> for the data sake. I did. Uh, I did an article a few weeks <clears throat> back on uh, kind of underrated slash overrated cards in the format, looking at seventeen lands where they were taken, average last seen at, and like you know, I I had uh, seen acquisition octopus on the battlefield a few times. I uh, like you said, I don't think I've ever played it, but I wasn't particularly impressed. I was shocked when I did my research and I went, "Wow, people take this card quite highly." So mm. that makes sense to me that uh, there's a huge differential there between you know uh, where I take it and the, the rest of the people in the format or in the uh the population takes it i just think it's a really bad card i just think it doesn't line up well with the format if it's three mana two two if you if you put it on a flyer you're kind of already winning with that flyer you know it's, it's slightly i don't like to use the term win more often but i think it is uh, does fall into that category same as covert technician i, I think people have dreams of it's like ooh. I put in a virus beetle off my covert technician. It's like, well, was that that good? Like, <laughs> you know, that, was, was that actually that good? So yeah, it's a card that I know definitely people take uh, higher than I do. But I think that you nailed it really because uh, what we see on that list, so acquisition tech, octopus and cover technician have around 1.2, 1.8% you pick them. So way below the 12.5, which will be default for the last pick, right. which means you actively, actively select against picking those cards. And it makes sense because they are quite high picks for other people and, and, and you just don't want to play them at all. There is the March of Burgeoning Light, which just tells me that you're not a rare drafter because you <laughs> see that card and you yep. ignore it. This is probably the rare that goes the latest during the draft portion. And you're still not tempted to pick it just for the gems because uh, 
Once you're infinite, you don't care about those 20 gems. Yeah, really. I guess uh, humble brags, eh? humble brags. <laughs> yeah, but <clears throat> then we have uh, Blade Bizarre Kitsune, which is one of those white aggressive cards that you didn't mention, but it's one of the category broadly. Imperial Subduer, a Ganja Exemplar, uh, Seven Tail Mentor, Moth Rider Patrol, Asari Captain, which I will count into that uh, group, and Skybless Samurai, which is sort of ca counting into that group. Yeah. So a bunch of the white cards that are attacking creatures are there. Uh, I think that Goshintai of Ancient Wars is something that you also mentioned during the streams quite frequently, that you just don't believe in this card, even in the mono-red decks. And I, I do agree with it, and uh, it, it is visible in the data. Mech Hanger, which is something that you mentioned, you might have uh, picked quite a lot of them, but never played them. Well, it seems that you just don't want to pick them even. I guess so. <laughs> and that's probably, what, that, that's probably the reason why it was not on that uh, list. Enormous Energy Blade is just rubbish, so um, uh, that that's that's it. I think Reality Heist is a card I picked quite a lot because I do like my Vault Progress and I don't have anything in the pack. I just pick it because it's an uncommon that yeah. hangs around there. Again, you're way above that kind of uh, uh, petty uh, collection. <laughs> well, you know, I actually, but, funny, I actually did put that card in my deck uh, like a week ago. I had this like 19 art. I, I was a very uh, do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do drafter on this draft where I had both reality heist and uh dragon spark reactor in my deck Oof. and uh <laughs> i know and i had like 19 20 artifacts it, they both still were not very good in my deck so. was it a blue uh, was it a blue red deck it was like a blue red splash black deck it had anvils okay, in it. okay. yeah well, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll come to that category okay later. great <laughs> um web spinner cuff that's that's an interesting one for me on that list yeah um, so yeah, there's the one four artifact uh, that has reconfigured. Yeah, so I just think this card isn't particularly good. I guess so. I think one four blocks pretty poorly in this format, as there's a lot of a lot of the threats are two toughness. So what happens often is you play this as your defensive thing, and it doesn't. And unlike a bamboo grow of archer that threatens to eat things, your opponents can often just go around it. So it's just like okay, well, it's very good at protecting against flyers, of course. But I, I find that um, often you. You, you just have it as it's almost like a wall. It's almost like a zero power creature uh, in a way. So you're paying three mana for this thing that's not very impactful, almost like a wall. And sure, it's got some applications of equipping later, but it the the equip almost isn't uh, anything because anything uh, any of the flyers it could block. Well, you put it on you know your Tanuki or whatever it is. Like it, it's that doesn't actually change combat very often, right? There, the, it's still going to be like, well, I can block still, <laughs> and now I just have a little bit. I'm a little bit bigger, so yeah, I, I don't think this card is uh, one I'm looking to put in my deck very often. Maybe if I had some, you know, I was a commie of terrible secrets and I needed another artifact or something. Well, the data definitely shows that you're far from prioritizing this card. You actively don't pick it, and probably that's also have have to do with the uh, people. Maybe, you know, in the memory of the uh, bow from Kalheim, which uh, yes. was a 2-3, and it was excellent. That card um, was great, yeah. I think that people pick this card maybe a bit too high for what it does. Mm -hmm. And and, and that, that's how it misaligns with, uh, with, with your preferences. Because you won't see them very late as well. All right. <clears throat> First pick, play rate. So I did this data on the uh, 17 Lens users and how frequently they play their first pick. Um, and I mean, basically in almost every kind of category of the deck I looked at, it was around 80% of the time people played their first pick, independently if they win one game in that draft or seven games in that drafts, uh, they pick around, uh, uh, they, they play their first pick around 80% of the time. There's this weird data point when people that uh, go 0-3 play their first pick only 70% of the time, and I still didn't explain it completely, but I think that it might have something to do with the retirement um, uh, rates and right. people not submitting proper decks because they just like retire at game zero. But I still had data uh, from from the draft, um, which would tell you that there is there there is some uh, bunch of people that retired deck like, without playing a game, even among the seventeen lands users. Yeah, but. My question is, where do you think you're positioned in that ranking? Do you think that you play your first pick more frequently or less frequently? Or That's a good question. I, I would like to think uh, I play it... Oh, man. I, I, like, when you said the 80% number, I kind of went, yeah, that sounds about right for what I, I would play. Because I, I do think it is a large cost to not play your first picks because you know it's there's this idea that i often talk about and in, in a perfect draft world your best deck or the best uh strategy is always to find the open lane right to be like my uh ideally 
if that was that was the perfect game that's how it worked out you once you identified the open lane you got the best deck at the table but of course it's not how it works out because your first pick holds a lot of weight and you've already locked in this awesome card whatever it is that you first picked right so that influences a lot of how you're um, going to navigate through the draft and i think it is a mistake a lot of the time that people move off of their first pick a little bit too often, I would say. So I might even put myself at higher. I don't know. I could be totally off in this, but I, I would guess I play my first pick a little bit higher than than most people, but might be off. Okay. So one thing about the data, yeah, what you mentioned makes very uh, quite a lot of sense to me because I would expect some sort of trend between the number of wins and, number, and, and percentage of the time you play the first pick. I would expect that. If picking the first pick and and playing it in your deck is so important, you should see a slightly higher fraction of um, of the um, uh, decks that had seven wins that played their first pick, um, and slightly lower fraction of the decks that had only one win and played their first pick. Yeah. But you don't, which means that probably there is this counterbalancing mechanism when people wean off a good first pick because they try to dirtle because they draft it. Well, let's call it too hard away. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of trying to simplify their uh, their thing. This is a very mind-boggling result when you think about it, that uh, at every number of wins, people play the first pick more or less in the same. Um, that is very fact. interesting, yeah. But let's look at where you land on that spectrum. Uh, boring. Ah, right, yeah. <laughs> right in the middle. Bang in the, <laughs> bang in the middle with the rest of the pack. So um, nice. I, I would say that they're, you're absolutely uh, 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 average. I'm sorry, Alex. To say oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry to be I'm so average. crude, but uh, in this particular statistics, you're very, basically very average. 81.2% of the time you played your first pick. and um, But at least you, well, you do it with a much better win rate than the average 79th user. So you can, you can keep that one for yourself. Yeah, we'll put it in my back pocket. I'll I'll, uh, I'll take pride in that. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, something to think. Uh, you don't have to marry your first pick, but it's worth sticking with it as long as you can, uh, unless the costs are becoming slightly too high. And it is an art, uh, at least for now. We, we maybe hopefully we can analyze it a bit more um, uh, in detail in the future. But uh, yeah. for now, it's more of an art than a science uh, in terms of when you should wean off and when not. All right, this ends the draft data portion. Now let's focus on the play data portion. And um, we're going to talk about your mulliganing. And there <laughs> I'm pretty sure pretty sure you're going to be guessing uh, pretty well. <laughs> we're also going to uh, look at uh, some of your data in time. And uh, I'm particularly going to look at the win rate in time. How did your win rate in the format change during the uh, progression of the format? And color preference and how that changed over time. And then we're going to look at some color win rates um, uh, where we might mention uh, the is it deck that you uh, talked before. And we're going to talk about specific card win rates and a, a bit more detail in there. Nice. But first thing, Mulligan. Average 17 lens user in Kamigawa Mulligan 10.8% of the game, of the games. Where do you see yourself in comparison? Wow, people mulligan 10% on average. That's a lot. Yes. I got to tell you. I got to tell you. That's a lot. <laughs> and it, not people, 17 lens users. Uh, yeah. The 17 lens of opponents actually mulligan probably around 12%. Oh, man. I want to I, I want to go low on this. I want to say I mulligan like 3% of the time. You want to mulligan three percent of the time? I, okay, I think I think I think it's going to I think it's I'm going to land in the I yeah, I mulligan three percent of the time. You're not far yeah. off. You're nice, 3. yeah. 3.8%. It's 3.8%. I mean, I didn't expect anything else from you because uh, <laughs> you're always uh, famously saying, oh, I probably should mulligan this hand. Let's keep it then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is something that you, well, you basically show that you don't have to mulligan as frequently because if your deck is built well mm -hmm. and you're the person that, you know, I watch the streams despite your bad sorting, you actually spend a... Uh, <laughs> very large amount of time thinking about the mana base, thinking about um, density of two drops, thinking about density of uh, cheap interaction if you don't have those two drops. I think that your decks are streamlined not to have to mulligan very frequently with the smoother. Right. You know, smoother, 99% of the games, you will get two, three, or four lands uh, if you play 17 lands, which usually you do. And if you play fewer, then you will accordingly uh, change your uh, mana curve and you will be able to afford not playing that fourth land on turn four because your deck can freely operate on three lands. And I think that this is the lesson that uh, your win rate is, well, absurd, honestly, and <laughs> you still don't mulligan. Uh, and probably because you don't mulligan as frequently, that uh, win rate is 
uh, uh, quite so high. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I attribute a lot of my wins to having seven cards when my opponent has six, honestly. Um, and, and like you said, the way I look at it is a, a building a good deck and building you know a good mana base, a good curve, you get the privilege of not having to mulligan because you can trust your deck. That's the way I put it, right? You can trust your deck and be like, you know what? Often when it's like, ah, oh, you know, you see some players like, ah, oh, this is kind of a sketchy hand, needs a few things. And well, I'll, I, you know, I agree with that. I, I will keep hands that are like, ah, oh, needs a few things as a sketchy hand. I, I imagine, or I would hope that my deck will give me those things because I built it well. And more, more times than not, I, I would say that it does. So. Okay. <clears throat> So before the next uh, thing, I'm going to sort of introduce the concept of running average because we're going to look at running averages for the next couple of categories. And basically running average is you have some time data or ordin ordinated data. Uh, instead of looking at this messy kind of plot where everything is jumping up and down um, uh, and you know, win, win rate data is very often like one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, yeah. which would be very, very awkward to plot. Instead of that, you choose a sort of window frame and you calculate the average within that frame. And then what happens is you move by one step and calculate the average in this frame, move, calculate the average in this frame. Mm. And then you just uh, do that until you reach the end. And what it results in is that you have this plot from the previous slide. And then you have those like small changes uh, over time. But um, because each dot in here is 10 data points, uh, it actually carries a bit more weight because you, you see at the large chunk of data inside of that one dot, and then you can observe trends. And that's very often it's used for, for example, if you want to calculate the um, changes in the average uh, temperature in somewhere, you, you have an annual cycle. And if you want to smooth out this annual cycle, you take 365 day frame, you calculate it and you che check it over uh, uh, in the daily increments. But because you take the whole year, you remove this kind of uh, seasonal variation. And I'm going to use it here uh, to basically try to show your win rates over the format where we're going to look at um, all your 1,000 drafts. But I'm going to calculate the average of the last 100 games and then, and then move by one and then move by one and then move by one. Oh, and nice. basically, we're going, to, we're going to see how your win rate progressed over this time, ups and downs. Cool. So... How did your confidence in play develop during Kamigawa? And what, where do you think is your winning years period in that format? And I know that it's a, a large ask because the format was long and you played a lot. But uh... <laughs> uh, So it's a good question. I, I know for this format, this format and the last format were actually atypical in the sense that I started low and I got, you know, I went higher as the format went on, uh, maybe dipping here and there. But I feel usually my trajectory is I start medium then go high or start high and then go low uh for kamagawa i know i started off low ish in like you know 55 to 60 range i would guess that my peak was when i started drafting heavy red decks for the first time when nobody else knew about them so or nobody else was drafting them anyways so that's probably somewhere in the like the two or three weeks ago range uh you know i guess in the uh march middle of march potentially uh, that's 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 what I, my guess would be. Okay, I think that yeah, you you know, part of being a good magic player is the uh, ability to self-analyze correctly, and I think that uh, large part of what you said was absolutely true. Um, you started low. That was basically the, the lowest point of your format. Was the first. Uh, keep in mind, this point here uh, is on the thirteenth of uh, February, so you have three days of data before you uh, included in it because it's right. the first hundred games. And you started pretty low, there was a dip, and then you started building up to this like first peak of your performance when you actually reached something like 70% uh, win rate. And then you stabilized for most of the format. You dipped somewhere like um, uh, last 10 days of, of, of March, but dipped slightly. I mean, we're still talking like 60% win rates here. And then you had this big spike of, uh, of, of, of your probably most winning period. And it's sort of like, dipped down to revert it to the average. And I think that it started growing when you started doing the uh, speed run, because obviously then you play with people that are in silver. When, yes, uh, <laughs> this uh, would make uh, sense. Ability. So I, I, I assume it grew now, but uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a crooked data because you can't compare 
this period when you played 86% of your games against Mythic players uh, with this one when you played with the poor souls in silver. <laughs> so does it sort of like meet what you expected? Yes, I, I can I can honestly tell you a story, I think. And, you know, I, at the risk of, you know, uh, telling a story to meet the data, as, you know, you always war warn against here. But I can see, uh, like, the, the big spike at the beginning where I went from zero to hero, <laughs> you know, from, from the low mid-50s to 70%. That's when I realized, oh, the green decks are really good and nobody's drafting Besage. Or maybe even not the green decks, but the sagas. I was like, I'm just going to take all the sagas. And my decks were great. Equalizes people figuring figured that out, and I think even where I, I dip a little bit uh, is I think that might have been me resi being resistant to drafting the red decks potentially, and then being like, uh, well, I should be drafting these green, getting into the green deck still, and then figuring it out uh, a little bit as it went on. But maybe not even because I actually maybe thinking about it, I might have even started drafting the red decks a little bit earlier than when their dip is. So I don't know if that actually even checks out. Um, yeah, I think that I think that data can tell an equally compelling story in a second. But yeah, uh, for sure, I'm, uh, I'm 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 more than well. Uh, we're going to look at. It. I think that part 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 of your intuition is is correct, but I think part might be actually what your brain tells you, and the data is slightly contradicting it. But yeah, we're gonna, for sure. We're going to see in a second because um, the next part is, you know, that Picasso had uh, his uh, <laughs> yeah. famous co color periods. He had the blue period in something like 19, 1902 to 1904. Then he moved to a rose period when he changes the coloring of his pictures. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm by no means saying that you're the Picasso of draft, although you're not far <laughs> off there. But um, you also had your color periods during this format. And uh, what I did is, again, using the same kind of um, running average, I looked at percentage that you played a particular color as your main color uh, in the last 100 games. And basically, based on that, I, I, I looked at whether you played like 80% of red at some stage or 40% or of blue. Now, keep in mind, these things don't add up to 100% uh, because, of course, you play usually two or three color decks even. Uh, so. Uh, uh, some 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 things will vary, but you know if you if you say eighty percent of my decks were had black as a main color in the in this period of hundred games, it means that you played black a lot. It doesn't tell you what you played the black with, basically. Right. Do you think you can identify your color periods in this format and 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 sort of like? Ah, <sighs> yeah. I mean, uh, do you want to go based on like? Uh, time over time, like what exactly? Yeah, over time, like from the start of the format through the middle stages, and uh... yeah. So I I would say early on it was green. I was just you know mm -hmm. as as most in the know people were doing drafting the green decks, the prancers, the tech wreckers, the besagers, and all that. And then I probably shifted towards a black blue stage where I was really into ninjas and you know black maybe black green black blue. Um, you know, it kind of got muddied. It was it was base green and then got muddied by some blue cards. Um, and the blue cards, I was, you know, very into ninjas. And then after ninjas, I think I got into this kind of weird phase where nothing was really prominent, I would say. I, was, I think that's where I kind of faltered a little bit, if my memory serves. And then red, and then maybe some sort of like blue whitey kind of espery stuff going on. But that that's my uh, again my human brain telling me what I remember. But I, I'm curious to see if I'm wrong about this. Your, your human brain, I think, worked absolutely fantastically in this particular case. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> the only problem of the setup that I have is I don't have my trusty laser pointer, and I don't think that you can see the my cursor on the screen. But let's let, let's try to see it. Whoa. <laughs> but you indeed started indeed started drafting heavily in green. So the first, you know, uh, 150 uh, games that you played, you were 80% of the time uh, in green of some combination. Mm -hmm. And th but during that period, uh, black started rising uh, consequently. And then you know, like around week um, week two three, uh, you reached the point that was your peak when 91% uh, of your decks contained black. Wow. As a main color, not nice. as a splash. And actually, that black stage lasted quite long. And if you look at the period between 23rd and to maybe 30th of uh, February, this is what you described as your black-blue phase, because you played almost always black and quite frequently with blue. And then, as you said, around the 10th of March, you have this model where all the colors are played more or less in sim similar frequencies. There is maybe some that are more preferred, some ones that are not preferred. I, 
when I did the data, I called it your sort of transition stage when you were yeah. figuring out what works because the previous things stopped working, I guess. Yeah. And also worth noting that even during that ninja period, uh, you started with playing almost no red and red started steadily, steadily climbing uh, until around half of your decks contained red in that uh, period when you were transitioning. And after the transition, um, it's quite clear from the data that you moved into a sort of red-black period. Yeah. where I think that you started drafting a lot of mono red and very often supplementing it with some black. Then uh, uh, around April Fool's, uh, I don't know if it's coincidental or not, uh, you started going on the white train and that's what I call your white period and yeah. you're calling it the Esper period. I didn't know that most of your decks were sort of Esper concoctions, but you clearly um, started prioritizing white and you know, like jump from uh, being played like 20% of the time to being played 80% of your decks uh, within, you know, like literally within four days or something. Because I don't know, you probably noticed that white was maybe slightly more open or maybe you figured better plans for that. And then it, when the data finishes, you sort of are reverting to some sort of like returning to red because the red fell out of favor very sharply in, in, in that period. Um, so you, you were at 70% red decks uh, on the 25th of March and on the 4th of, uh, April, it was maybe 5%. And then there's a steep increase when you start doing the uh, uh, speed run. Yeah. I don't know if that's linked to the preference of trying <laughs> to draft an aggressive deck to make the speed run speedier. But, you know, data data doesn't lie. Well, I have been uh, I have been known to first pick Iron Apprentices in the past few days. So perhaps, perhaps that is true. Yes. <laughs> um, this is really interesting to me, actually, because I think... So... I wonder, uh, maybe this is like a self-evaluation thing for you know, both myself and for other people listening or watching. It just, I mean, I think this is a clear indication that I have preferences going into the draft and have uh, paths I want to go down. Like, I, I, it's not just, well, let's jump into the draft, let the draft take me for a ride of some sort. Just like, let me, you know, see what works out. At, you know, And that's a fine thing to do. I don't, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. But clearly there's patterns here where it's like, I'm, I have these phases, right? I don't know how much that benefits me or how much it maybe hurts me even. Who knows? Uh, I would like to think it doesn't hurt me, but I just know that partially based on what I've had recent experience with and that I want to try out the decks a little bit more and tune them, partially based on I know, okay, well, I, I feel like people, the conversation around green this week is that it's very, very good, so I, I kind of want to avoid it. Um, it. It's very much before I sit down at the table. You know, I think often when you think of like drafting the hard way, people uh, warn you against having biases before you sit down at the table right but and again i'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing i'm not trying to say don't listen to those people i'm just trying to say it is clear to me at least that that's not what's happening with me <laughs> you know i i'm doing something different i mean i i always approach it slightly differently i think that it's in human nature to have preferences and you'd rather should admit that you might have preferences than pretend that you don't and um that's the kind of like uh my my philosophy about approaching the draft, I very often will draft with preferences, like very strong preferences even. Yeah. But I also know that those preferences are not written in stone and they're not based on like, oh, I like big creatures, therefore I draft yeah, green. Yeah, exactly. Um, my preferences are based on, you know, green is a bit too open and not to use that kind of opportunity. So I'd rather do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, are you surprised by that graph or i mean it aligns pretty well with what you were describing and i think that especially when you said that oh i had this period when i couldn't like figure out what i'm doing and yeah and you can literally <laughs> see that from the from the because this is the particular in particularly <clears throat> the type of graph that i would be hoping to maybe be able to uh do for every 17 lens user uh so that they can actually trace their uh, uh trace their preferences uh, over the format and I probably want just to do it so that uh, uh, I can force uh, Ben Stark to post his. <laughs> and if and if all five colors don't go in the fifty uh, percent line, I'm going to complain. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He's not practicing what he preaches. So I mean, the the two biggest things actually come from the end of of this graph here. Where, like you said, you were surprised a little. Bit. I'm surprised how deep, how steeply red declined. Actually, I didn't realize how much I had been biasing away from red um, at the in the last you know week or two, and then white having that sharp increase and that one doesn't surprise me as much because i was noting before earlier in this uh episode 
where I was saying, oh, I hadn't been valuing Oath where I think I should have. quite Like, I was taking it highly, but not quite as highly. And then I had a period I was like, well, let me just see what that happens if I do first pick these Oaths and, and keep going. You know, actually, partially because of what you, your your appearance on Limited Resources is saying, just, just you know, advocating for just how well they play even in multiples, right? So actually, you you uh, were, were actually, you know, this shows how content feeds into, uh, you know, action here, where because I listened to you, I was like, oh, I want to do this different thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Playing four oaths is great, but then mulliganing decisions might be sometimes harsh when you open a hand with three of them. And uh... <laughs> this is true. This is true. But uh, one thing that I would maybe draw your attention to is blue. And it looks from me that blue was the color that all through the format you drafted the hard way because there are some minor ups and downs, but it stays within that 60% to, to 30% range almost throughout the whole uh, duration, which tells me that you know that blue is good, but you want to wait to see if it's open uh, before you actually commit to drafting it. Remember, you have a good reason, like you get a Tamashi as a first pick or something like that. Yeah, I think that the way I put it is that the blue's got some really, really good commons, right? Moon Circuit Hacker, Moon Snare Specialist, uh, Modern Age. The top four or five are excellent, but it's also got a lot of junk, right? So relative to the top commons of the other color pairs, I think blue actually you could argue, well, maybe not black, but you could argue that it has better commons than all the other colors. It has a lot, uh, it's a lot shallower than the other colors though, I would say, where if it's open, great, I'm willing to move in, but I don't want to be in a spot where I get, okay, a few modern ages and then a moon circuit hacker, but then have to play, you know, the the really bad uh, commons that are, you know, cards I would hope not to play. Again, cards I would want to play a basic land over <laughs> a lot of the time. Okay, so the real thing comes, and I hope that the conversion from PowerPoint to PDF is not going to ruin it, but no, no. when you overlay those t the previous graph with this one, which I oh, hopefully did well. This is great, yeah. Because here we see, uh, I think I'm going to tell you your story of the format as I see it from the data. Great. Where you basically started playing heavily green, but your win rates were not high and they were slightly increasing because you were getting better. Maybe there was the saga period. And in this time, as your win rates were increasing, your dependence on black was increasing at the same time and also weaning off white. So I think that the combination of those two factors, I stopped drafting white, I started being uh, very heavily black. Uh, that sort of contributed to this first rise. And then you had this uh, very good period of ninjas, but then you probably got bored with ninjas and uh, you still continued drafting black. You had this moment of confusion <laughs> because you understood format, so you can draft almost anything. When you when when you go that deep into the drafts, uh, you know exactly what to draft. And I think that this was the period when you were drafting the hard way because you knew how to build every deck and you um, started to, uh, doing it. And this is the moment when you first discovered the mono red. And I think that this is a slight bump. And I th I think, that this is the moment when you overstay your welcome because other people caught up with red. And the dip yeah. is not exactly because um, you stopped drafting red. I think that uh, the dip might be because you continued drafting red when uh, other people started doing it. And maybe you were not the only person at the table, uh, but maybe you were one of the two people at the table. And that sort of reflected in your um, win rate. Also, people learned how to play against mono red because uh, they were, you know, like everyone encountered it at some stage. And then you have this, well, modest dip. It's still 60% win rate, so let's not cry about it. <laughs> and then you see that this big increase when you actually reach the peak of your win rate is yeah. corresponding to your drafting of the uh, white in the later format. Yeah. So I think, and, and also weaning of black that might have been a bit more contested at that stage and red yeah. that because people started jumping on that uh, aggro ship. And actually the blue-white deck is perfectly positioned against um, those... Uh, uh, red black deck so at the same time you went on a good color pair that was open and um uh, made decks that were aligning well against the meta game so that's 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 the sort of picture that i get from this graph do you think it's overstretching it or oh no 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 i think you described it perfectly so i i think especially uh the part where you said i overstayed my welcome with red a little bit because i i actually felt in my heart of hearts that there was like a three or four day window where I was constant, I could just force it. I could go like, I, I can just wheel all the good red cards. I know I'm going to get close to mono red decks. Or I, I got like, you know, 14 land mono red decks because I just had so many good red cards. And then after a few days, I kind of went, okay, people are catching on. Uh, I can't do this anymore. But I kind of either 
just wanted to keep doing it because I thought it was fun. Or I thought, well, you know, maybe people, maybe this is just a small, you know, field of variance. People back off of it. And they they didn't, right? So, um, you know, red decks, red decks are still draftable for sure today. And as you can see, you know, uh, my recent data, I've been drafting them a lot. But I do think I, uh, if my goal is to have the highest win rate possible, I should have backed off of it a little bit sooner than I did. Yeah. And it's very interesting. Just uh, like the story I was telling of like, I just started taking oath higher. Well, big surprise, Alex, when you first, when you start taking good commons higher, <laughs> you're going to win more, I think, you know, so yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I, so I think that I, I'm actually curious is maybe this is the moment, like at this around 15th of March, when you had this like slight peak from drafting mono red, most likely. Yeah. Is it possible that, uh, after that, when you had the slight dip, you couldn't get on the mono red, and you had to start supplementing with the black cards. Is it possible that it you played more of the Ragdos decks than the pure mono red ones? Yeah, I was playing. Uh, yeah, for sure, I was playing red black. I was playing a little bit of red white in there, so occasionally, um, you know. Maybe, well, that yeah. will drop your win rate. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Okay. I mean, ho hopefully, hopefully, aligning the win rate draft on your color preferences will tell you something about uh, how format evolved in your particular case. And I think that everyone that plays over hundred drafts, I think, would benefit from that kind of curve because in my case, do. it would just look like point here, point there, point here, point right. there. And, and, and you would have to drop them by 10 percentage points probably for the win rate purposes. Um, right. Let's look at the color pair wins. Great. So which color, okay. And oh, by the way, I took all the 10 color pairs, but I also took monocolor decks and three color decks. And I'm curious uh, uh, to see what do you expect to see from that graph? <sighs> okay, so let me think about this. Uh... I would say my most winning deck is probably I want to say black red, but maybe that's that's again is my my bias of, of what I think I want with. I think I want to say that black red and I don't think any of the green color pair. Well, maybe green black at the beginning of the format that may tie in for enough. Uh, but I'll say black red and maybe blue black. Oh, blue black actually might be better than black red. Maybe my number one is is blue black. Um, I'm trying to think if any white color pairs get in there. Maybe blue white because I think maybe the times when I was white, I or white blue, it was because I had good reasons to be. Maybe it's Mashi. Maybe the the lane was open. So those are my top three. I I might just be wrong that green isn't in there, but I think those are my top three. And what do you think about three color decks? How would they align against against the ten color pairs? Where do you think the the three color decks would, as as a totality of them, would end up? Like top half, bottom half. I want to say I want to say top half because I feel like you know often when you look at aggregate data of splashes, the you got the no the... no no okay so just to, just to be very very precise okay splashes I didn't count as three color decks I counted three color decks as three color dedicated oh decks. gotcha gotcha and monocolor decks with a splash will still count as monocolor and uh, blue black with splash of red like one one or two cards in red that will still count as a blue black deck I would count just straight to be clear. straight three colors is probably not good <laughs> Pro probably those are like ooh, I because my my uh, you know natural tendencies bias me away from you know even if like picking up a bunch of fixing and then playing all my cards so but i'd imagine can, the time like the six 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 mana base yeah no 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 i i i uh, I, I do stand by that i do think i do practice what i preach there <laughs> uh i would say that the time that i ended up there i had some weird draft that i just had to play you know picked up the fixing emergency mode and then played all my cards so i think that's lower than the other good decks and and where do you think the monocolor decks align probably high I would say because I, if I get a monocolored deck, that means that I have enough playables that I feel comfortable playing monocolored. Okay, now let's see. Let's see how it looks. Like. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> blue red is so funny. <laughs> That's wow. why I told you that this data doesn't count because you actually managed to get a zero percent win rate with the blue red uh, in the data. Wow. <laughs> it was over six games, but basically you played it twice and you o three twice, and you wow. don't o three very frequently. I can no, tell you I that. don't. It's very funny though, because you you were popped you popped into my stream right before this, and I was I was drafting a blue red deck I seven owned with, so it's very funny that that, that doesn't happened. count. It doesn't count. Doesn't, doesn't count. count. I know it doesn't, doesn't count. count. Doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, you sniped me. You got me. So so like I said, you know the the seventy percent win rate with mono colored that you know that's pretty big. That's 
pretty good. And I think that you were absolutely right with the blue, black, and black, red. These are the, your two top um, win rate color combinations and buy quite a lot, actually. You know, you, you don't see that those differences are big, but uh, it's mainly because this blue, red is ruining the graph. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but you have like 70% win rate with the monocolor decks and around 68% uh, with the blue, black, and black, red. So the Grixis colors uh, seem to be working fine with you. And then, as you said, I mean, you have the white, black, and white, blue. 63 and 60 well 64 and 63 percent win rate and black green as the first green deck at 60 well 63 more or less the same as the white blue and then you have the bunch of uh white green at 60 red green at 60 three color decks i think that 57.8 is a reasonable win rate for decks that have you know like a bunch of colors uh, cards in, in multiple colors yeah and then uh definitely uh at the at the at the rear you have the uh, white red with 52.6 and uh, blue green with 51% and blue red with a magnificent 0% win rate. <laughs> that's Congratulations. so funny. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had to like, I, I, I saw the data and I'm like, what, 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 what how, how did that happen? But, um, <laughs> here we yeah. are. You only played two drafts with it. I, 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 I don't think I wanted to ask you a tricky question, like if you could recommend good, uh, good, is it strategies before I showed that draft? But I thought it might have been <laughs> you... a bit too, too cruel. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Sam Black hasn't done a podcast on Blue Red. So, Alex, I was, I was wondering, do you know? You, he did you actually this Blue? weekend. Oh, did he do it this week? Oh, okay, no, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but um, maybe maybe if you pick those acquisition octopi and um, and those uh, covered operatives. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, uh, let's move. Let's let's move on. So now we go to the six graphs in a row that we'll be dealing with card win rates because I want to look at different um, types of win rate uh, for, 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 for particular reasons. Uh, just to tell you, uh, the card has to have minimum 50 games under its belt, which a lot of cards will do. I mean, it's going to be rares that you play frequently, uh, probably all the uncommons and, and most commons. And um, well, basically, we're going to look at the games played win rate, which means the win rate of the games that the card was in your deck. And that will tell you something about the power of the card, but also about the power of the color combination. So yeah. since you know your uh, win rates of color combinations, you can put that uh, at the back of your head. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to be talking about the best cards and the worst cards that fulfill that cr those criteria. So over 50 games played. Um, then we're going to look at the games in hand win rate, which only takes into account the games where the card was drawn. And obviously, there will be more games played uh, with the card than, than the games you played with the card when it's been drawn. So here you will lose a bunch of cards that were, you know, like for, for played maybe, you know, in, in, in 80 games. They won't make it to um, to the game in hand win rate because you, you draw a, a card in roughly half of the games uh, uh, based on the data. So we're going to, but the, the, the good part of that is that Game and hand win rate tells you more about the card itself and less about the strength of the deck because obviously you only look at the games when the card had some sort of impact, hopefully, because it yeah. was drawn. And the last thing I'm going to look at is the improvement when drawn, the stat that we don't use very often, but this is the difference between um, uh, the win rates of, uh, of, of the games when the, you drew a card and, and, and the games when you didn't. Um, so uh, basically it will show you if the card um if the card has a positive improvement when drawn it means that when you draw it you win more if it has a negative one it means that when you draw it you actually lower your win rate by uh, some amount because uh maybe the card was not on the plan and i would be very very curious to see uh, uh your guesses in that particularly in that in that last category yeah but okay so what do you think were the top cards in terms of your games played win rate? And probably, you know, I mean, we know that there are rares, but I, I think it probably should focus on commons, commons, just to make it fair. Yeah. Okay. So games play. And this is this is the one where it's just like it was in your deck, right? This isn't. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. It only had to be in your deck. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm gonna go. Yeah, like you said, back in my head, the the black cards are there. I I think. With the strength of black decks and the strength of the cards, I would say, you know, it's the it's the top commons and the top, you know, Life of Tashiro and the top black commons, or Keep Reckon Raid, Twist and Brace, Fire Spiel. I think those have got to be up there. Uh, and, and again, this is colored by 
best decks and if i'm winning with you know the red black and blue black then i think it would reason that a lot of black cards are up there i probably even am missing some in there uh if I go down a little bit comedy of terrible secrets is probably in there as well um and then i guess then if i'm going to other colors um well red is a good place to go but i imagine that the game drawn might be a little bit or sorry gameplay might be a little bit lower for that those cards in general maybe not but i would just you know put the synthesizer and i guess let's go to the top red uncommon let's go to uh kumano faces cocks let's go to that one and blue cards maybe something in the ninja package behold the unspeakable uh i think those are somewhere in the neighborhood of, of you know grixis cards <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's take a look. I, I was actually I had to open the presentation and the other one just to just to, just to see what I should expect. So I, I told you there will be some rares in that. Ah, uh, yes. Top okay. card was the uh, biting palm ninja, but I told you not to focus on the rares uh, for the right reason. So if we uh, discount the soul transfer and biting palm ninja, which were really high, only cult anvil is the top game played win rate um, uh, card that you have. Wow. Then we have Goro Goro. Um, uh, which is also a rare, so you shouldn't have been focusing on that. Naomi is there, which um, uh, with seventy one point eight percent win rate uh, across the game. Me. I assume, I assume this is your Esper period. Yes, but it's funny. Even in that period, I don't think I played all that much time. I mean, I played the card, you know, for sure. But it doesn't stick out as like, ah, oh, yes, I remember my Naomi phase where I cast that card and attacked with her a bunch. So I mean, you didn't have to play it a lot. You had to play it only over 50 games, which right. means that you played it in, what, uh, seven, eight drafts that you trophied, for example. That will be enough. Oh, no, actually, you can play it in, yeah, seven, seven trophy drafts will, will be enough to make it an insane win rate. Right, that makes sense. And then we have the Sokas and Smelter. Uh, these are all at 71, 72% uh, win rate. The first two cards were like 81 and 78% win rate, which is quite uh, quite impressive, I have to say. that That's above anything that we see for um, for aggregate 17 lens data, for, for probably for a good reason. <laughs> uh, but then we see uh, Assassin's Inc. and Lethal Exploit, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. Um, and also that that sort of like shows you that we saw soul transfer, assassin's Inc. and lethal ex exploit uh, quite high, but that might have been that uh, basically you played those cards only when you had decks that lacked um, twisted embrace. Potentially, and yeah. It it could also be. Hmm, I wonder if this this makes any sense. But since I don't take those cards very highly, it might have been the times I played those cards were when black was very open because that's you know normally people take those higher than i do so if i got them later than i should uh that would make some sense because it's like i'm, I'm paying a lower price for the card than other people but maybe that's not tied into this as much um mm. but yeah yeah but and then you have a bunch of red cards like gift of wrath and, and the comparable in power level fable of the mirror breaker i mean also makes <laughs> very makes close two -two. Yeah. makes a two two no yeah, it's the same it? thing makes it's a two two thing. boost some creatures whatever uh well, that's very that's very interesting. <laughs> Gift, of, Gift of Wrath is in the top ten, right? Like as that, a game as a game played card. Yes, uh, game played. That means true. that it's it true. was put in good decks, and this, and this and true. it probably didn't disturb their win rate too much. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then you have the Iron Hoof Boar, Unstoppable Ogre, that continues with the red package at around sixty nine percent, which makes me think that uh, maybe not the Fable of Mirror Breaker, because I'm sure that you splashed it in multiple decks uh, when you when you dirtled a lot. Yeah. But Gift of Wrath, Iron, Iron Hoof Boar, and Unstoppable Ogre are probably the sort of like fringe cards that you put in your mono red decks, like not always, but sometimes, and 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 probably they they benefited from being in those good mono red decks as a probably worst card in the deck. Uh, that's why the game games played win rate is a sort of tricky statistic to look like. And then at the end, we have Teaching of the Kirin, which, okay, makes sense. It's a good rare saga, but uh, Papercraft Decoy, it's quite high, actually. Yeah, that one is pretty interesting. So that's one that I I, I actually like that card, I think, most more than most people. Uh, but I only include it... Well, I include it sometimes just as, you know, my 23rd card. But when I include it often, it's there for a reason, as in I'm sacking it to a smelter. I am upping my artifact count. It's providing, like, I think it's an okay card just in general. And then it provides some sort of additional value, something that the deck needs, where it, it, it gives some sort of synergistic, uh, you know, synergistic, synergistic addition to, to that deck would be my exp, exp, uh, explanation there. 
Yeah, in, in, in my in my um, experience with the card, it um, it provides my opponent an extra value by giving them a target for life of Toshiro, <laughs> and for them for them it always works. They always yeah. draw a card out of them somehow. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, Enough I heard I heard people. very uh, a very smart person on Limited Resources said that uh, you know playing around Life of Toshiro <laughs> is often it, at this point in the format is often pretty good to do. You know, was it a Ben Sack? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Ben Sack. I can't I can't remember the guy's name, but <laughs> yeah, some something Eastern. Um, all right. So, what do you think were your bottom games played win rate cards? Oh, I am in so the format. I am so excited to see these. Uh the one that springs to mind is I, maybe not. okay. So the one that I I know like a card I know I play more than I should probably a little bit is like Aki Ember Keeper. I, I don't think it's a bad card, but I probably pick it up a little bit too or like not too early, but it, it stays in the deck when I just because it's a good it's a two drop it's a playable and I think a lot of times the card is not very good. Um, so that's that's something that I'm thinking of. Uh, I guess it'd also probably be just cards and bad decks too, right? Like bad cards and bad decks. So maybe something in like a, a, a I'm trying to think of a I don't play Boros very much, so that probably doesn't have account for too much here. But maybe something in a green deck where I kind of train wrecked a little bit. I was like trying to get in that weird phase where I was still trying to get into green decks. So a bad green card in a green deck, something like uh, the Coiling Stalker, right? The Green Ninja. Or even like Jukai Trainee, which is okay, but probably probably down there. Um, I I would I would be, get guess that there's a lot of bad green cards on this list. Is my thought. Okay, let's uh, let, let's take a look. Um, I'm not going to torture you with uh, having to invent 15 cards on the list. <laughs> um, so I mean, the bottom of the list is Jukai Naturalist uh, with 44 percent uh, win wow. rate when you played the card, and I think that this sort of tells that. You were not having major success with the white green decks in this format. I think if if, if I remember correctly, uh, and then I won't pretend that I remember, but I'm gonna actually check it in the other uh, uh I mean it had the 60% win rate, but um maybe you played it slightly different when it was successful, and when you tried to maybe play those full um full enchantment synergies like you would with the naturalist, uh, it didn't work very well. Yeah, that does it make that, sense. It it does. I just it's like staggeringly low, like very, very, very low. Forty four percent. Yeah, but I mean, uh, keep in mind that the next three cards are Greater Tanuki, which is a sort of enchantment green white sort of uh, tinted card, uh, Blossoming Sands, which is the white green dual land, and Cami of Transience, which well, you would expect that card to be uh, almost a bomb, but somehow yeah. it it just it just is one of your lowest cards in terms of the uh, games played win rate. I, I actually think maybe, uh, like, you know, you're talking about how I had relative low success with green-white. I actually think that comes from a lot of the time when I try, I was trying to draft green-white a little bit smaller. I wasn't prioritizing top end as much. I wasn't prioritizing the six drops and the big the finishers and the good, you know, the ways to actually grind out the game. So uh, I guess it makes sense to me that these, like, green-white cards have low win rates, uh, game-played win rates. Because, yeah, I just think I was probably building these decks a little bit wrong. For a while i mean do, do, do you think that maybe there was like a a, a a bunch of drafts where you just like first pick coming of transients and tried to do the thing maybe yeah maybe that too i was just like oh this card's awesome uh let's see if we can make it work that that could be because true. i mean if if we go up the list i mean uh, obviously naturalist at 44 percent win rate was really low and then the other ones around 53 52 percent that's pretty low for your standards at least uh, but if we go a bit up the list we have commune with spirits at 57 percent uh, Jukai Trainee at 57.5, uh, Golden Tate Disciple, which I think also would fit into those kind of a small ball uh, enchantment synergy decks, and Tales of Master Sashiro also at 58. I mean, 58, don't get me wrong, is not a bad win rate, it's just a bad win rate for your standards. I would love to compare all these cards, like these specific cards, to where Sam Black's uh, game per, game played win rate for these cards is, <laughs> you know, because I think he's definitely got a better he as as a player he's got a better handle on this style of deck. He just in his he gravitates more towards the style of deck than I do. And I, I I would assume it would it would be very large differences. There's even funny. There's some rares in this like like yeah said, no the, and some good rares no yeah I like mean, inventive iteration. I don't know. Maybe you just like again. Maybe this was the draft where you first picked it and then you went into some color combination that was not super open because you were too much, you know. 
Maybe All maybe I tried it. to I tried to splash it because it was such a powerful oh, card, and I didn't like. Maybe I just like it was an odd draft, and I just like tried to jam it in there. I'm not sure. Yeah. That there's also Ecologist Terrarium, which I think that is um, some sort of testament to the card. I mean, for me, it worked in several decks, but they always and every single time had a network terminal in them, and right. I just used the Terrarium as my artifact to top uh, of choice. Uh, in those decks, but apart from that, I found that it's very cumbersome because this extra ability of getting a plus one plus one counter just doesn't matter at all if you play those kind of decks that overwhelm people. The extra plus one plus one counter won't do much. This card makes a lot of sense to me on this list because it's a card that uh, not only does it likely mean I am splish splashy, maybe have an awkward splash or something. But it also means, you know, just like bad mana in general is, is going to lower your win percentage. But it's kind of the bottom of the barrel fixer. It's kind of like, oh, I need something, mm. you know? So it, so it makes sense that it's like, it's in a bad deck already. <laughs> and then yeah. it's like, okay, Network terminal, it is not. It is not network terminal. No, I love network terminal. But um, And then there is also um, worth noting Prodigy Prototype, uh, Search Hacker Mac, and uh, Colossal Sky Turtle. Any thoughts of, on the turtle? Yeah, that one's uh, maybe I I I actually think I probably cast that card like early on when I was playing that card more often than I should have instead of just the regrowth mode, you know, just like keeping I, it. I for... think that also blue, blue green except for the blue red was your lowest win rate um, right. archetype, and maybe that yeah. suffers from that. I think and so, that too. I think worth mentioning that it has a markedly higher win rate than your average win rate for the archetype. So actually, it's six percentage points higher the win rate of Colossal Sky Turtle than of you playing blue green right so it's Which probably more think, the deck it was, than it was than, probably yeah it was probably yeah. played in those three color concoctions sometimes and then they had around the same win rate so probably preferred on par for the power level of the decks in those kind of color combinations right yep so uh let's look at the game in hand win rate where we actually look more on the actual power of the card because you only look at the half games when you played it in the deck but only the half where you drew them give or take so what do you think will be the most successful uh game in hand cards so and i can i i already can guarantee you you are not even going to be close to guessing the top card in in terms of game and uh game and hand win rate oh that's great okay i'm so excited so i mean i was gonna go for the easy ones and just say the good like keep uh fable of the near breaker biting no no, no but, uh, the, the, so i i think that you can skip rares for that because okay, there's okay. Just not enough games for that it's going to be only uncommons and commons in this okay. category so uh i suppose i would just guess I, I guess i would guess the top commons like you know okiba reckoner i do i feel like we're, i've been talking i've seen this for so many guesses but it just makes sense to me just like okiba reckoner aid virus beetle maybe modern age modern age would make sense to me as a card i think i play well like i know a lot of people have uh you know they, they said they found it hard to figure out when to loot not when not to loot um and i think i play the card particularly well so that might be up there um, I wonder if, hmm, what else? Maybe uh, some of the blue ninja cards I think are trickier-ish to use, and I think I use pretty well. So like the the blue ninjas up there, um, and I, on commons, I should mention on commons too. So it's the best thing I draw. Uh, maybe, I mean, I'm gonna go for the obvious one and say life of Shiro, and maybe uh, Kappa Tech Wrecker too. <laughs> Um, I, I think that Kappa Tech Wrecker didn't make it, but only on the number of games. I think yeah, that you that played it. Sense. You played it less than you than you think. But okay, let's 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 go on with it because uh, uh, it's been a long stream already, and I know that you streamed before, so you might be completely uh, exhausted. But Tranquil Coast <laughs> is your. But I thought that. about it. I thought about it, and it might be might, there might be a reason for that because I think that uh, you will probably more frequently play it in a deck that required it to get this white mana for something that you do as a splash. Yes. When you draw it, you have a guarantee of doing that. When you draw your Trunkful Cove in a deck that has Oaths and uh, Sunblade uh, Samurai, instantly your Sunblade Samurai has become a 4-4 Vigilance rather than cycle, gain to life, and bring a Plains to your hand, which improves the Sunblade Samurai by quite a lot. So I think that maybe that's the reason. And 77% game and hand win rate, this is not a fluke, uh, uh, this result. It means right. that the, this particular land and, and uh, was, was extremely important um, uh, in, in a, some category of the decks that you were playing. Uh, and obviously, there is going to be some variance in there uh, because your data sizes are not that big. But it's at least worth noting that Tranquil Cove is your most successful game and hand win rate uh, card uh, uh, from all of them. 
That's uh, why it's but, my es- Esper concoctions. That's what that's what it was. It, it ties the room together. Exactly. But uh, Kumana faces Kakazan. I think that this card is not surprising. It would be probably even higher if it's in the opening hand because you owe you win hundred percent of the games when you have it in the opening hand. Yep. Um, then you have Lethal Exploit, and I think that this card. Um, I would be very curious about your opinion because this card like was stellar in 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 both games played and it's even higher game and hand win rate. So which surprised me by quite a lot. Yeah, so this is a card that's gone up and up for me as the format's gone on. You know, the kind of story at the beginning of the format was oh you don't want too much of the small ball, whatever removal, you know, removal's not very good against the sagas. And I think as the format's gone on, um that position has been shifted back a bit, especially because People don't get as many sagas. You're only going to face three, four sagas for most people. So you do just want good interaction spells. So a few things I think are happening here. One, uh, my Esper decks use, you know, use a two mana cheap interaction spell pretty well just to stay alive early. That's pretty nice. But two, when I'm pairing it with red, you get some nice synergies. Because if you can turn this from a negative two, negative two into a negative three, negative three, it's actually quite a large difference. And often I have Iron Apprentices and Simeon Slings and Rabbit Batteries, stuff like that. So I think in the decks I'm playing it in will be better than the aggregate data because I think people are putting it in like black green decks and stuff like that. Or just like, okay, it's a little bit small ball, a little bit whatever. Um, You're not, you don't really care about point removal, cheap point removal. Your creatures block pretty well, where I think for me, I'm getting big blockers out of the way with it. Yeah, I mean, basically, when you look through the list, I see Kumana faces Kakazan and Lethal Exploit. You explained very well uh, what your rationale for having it is. Uh, then you have Sokenza Smelter at 73%, um, Life of Toshiro at 72 That's also like the early interaction that plays the same sort of role as Lethal Exploit in some decks. Chlorine Torment, which is uh, mm-hmm. important when you play Black Red, I guess. Yep. Um, Voltage Surge, Patchwork Automaton, Searchlight Companion. Uh, these are all the sort of like the cards that you have in your mono red or mono red with the black splash uh, deck that you want to actively draw. Yeah. The rest is fluff that sort of makes you not lose and occasionally uh, becomes useful itself. But these are this is the this is the sort of skeleton of the deck, like the the the, the core of it that you want to draw. Don't you agree totally. with that? Yes. Yes. One hundred percent. But uh, some cards are uh, a bit surprising. I mean, Longreach also had good numbers across the board uh, for you. You drafted it a lot. It uh, had a high win rate, and it has a high game and hand win rate, which tells you something about the card. And I think that this is also like a very skill-intensive card that I'm, uh, I could expect that you're playing it very well. You know when to bounce it with a ninja or something, and yeah. uh, you know when to uh, when to play it. Uh, do, do I went, wait a turn or go for it? Shrine Steward is a surprising one. Yeah. What do you have to say about this one? Is it uh, just paired with Twisted Embrace? Because when you play Shrine Steward, you also draw Twisted Embrace? Uh, well, I think I, I need to attribute this again to the Esper Concoction kind of stuff where I, it's very often if I'm in that space, I have the Blue Shrine or the White Shrine or not often the Black Shrine. I don't play that one so much. But often when I put it in my deck, when it makes my deck, I've got three, four things to go get with it, right? So it's it's always, it's not like, well, this is the last pick playable. I have two auras. I hope I don't draw both of them. It's getting... When it's in my deck, it is getting a creature or an aura, usually a good removal spell, very often, right? So I think just selection of when that card makes my deck plays a large part in this. And I think that the last three cards, the um, Azusa's Many Journeys, the Modern Age, and uh, Behold the Unspeakable, are sort of like these are the backbone cards together with Life of Toshiro Umezao of this saga kind of uh, put everything five color deck uh, or choose three colors and play them. Because I think that this card has been so underrated, as this has many journeys, uh, yeah. because this this lets you to basically play against aggro deck and get to your mana fast enough so that you don't die. And and it was and the three life is also like non-trivial in those kind of games. And um, against slower decks, you can actually ramp and just start beating them because they are not very quick of this of the blocks if they don't play that extra land. And it's actually. This is one of the single reasons why uh, those kind of slow controlling decks, I did some maths on them, and you actually want to be on the draw quite frequently when you play them. And the more mm-hmm. as as many journeys you have in your deck, the more you want to be on the draw because yep. because it ramps you, so it eliminates this problem of you starting with less mana. But drawing that extra card yep. gives you the extra chance of of, of using this first chapter uh, in it. So I think Beautiful. that um, yeah. It is it is a very interesting list, and Tranquil Cove is definitely a shocker there. <laughs> yes, just look at how, how higher the win rate of it is, and uh, you know, 
I expect some variance, but uh, I also expect that even if there is quite a lot of variance, it would still end up on this list, which um, uh, makes me makes you think how in the um, Imperial Oath meta game it is important to have the uh, extra sources of white mana beyond the samurai that doesn't yep. cost you your normal color slots because how often did you play white when white was only oaths? Uh, I think a decent amount. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. I mean, yeah. let's not count samurai as a white card in that. Sure, game. sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. All right. I but think but yeah, just, um, the, just quickly there, the Asusa, you're, you're right. Like that one has stuck out a few times during this episode where it's just like, that's come up again and again, where it's just like, wow, that, that one surprised me compared like where, how it's performing in my decks or my hands compared to aggro. Cause I, you know, I think the, like you were saying, the kind of conversation around the card is it's very medium basically, but apparently, I don't know, whatever I'm doing, it's, it's making the card shine. So <laughs> I guess I should take it higher. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you want to go into that kind of color combinations, it doesn't fit the Esper shell, does it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> also, now you're doing a speed run. Just ignore the Azusa's uh, many journeys and focus on voltage search. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so what do you think are the bottom cards in terms of game and hand win rate? Whew, wow, this is going to be an exciting one to see. Uh, so I, I think that, again, I'm going to go to the uh, the Ember Keeper. The Aki Ember, Ember Keeper, I think, is a card that makes it to a lot of my decks, but maybe loses me a lot of games because it gets sniped off by either like Jashiro or uh size i've gotten seismic wade for so many times <laughs> with that card um what else uh, i think maybe <sighs> crappy red cards uh, again i don't really tend to put the crappy red cards in my deck aside from that I i'm thinking maybe probably green cards again I, I i think they would make sense given what you what we saw before about the green cards underperforming in my hands it would, it would reason to me that I think green cards would be on this list as well. Sorry. <clears throat> Before I lose the voice. Now let's look at it. I mean, you were, I can already tell you, you were right with the Ember Keeper. It's one of the lowest cards in your yeah. uh, list. Uh, it's there at 55% win rate. But the lowest card was Greater Tanuki. Yep. At 51.8, so 52% win rate. Tales of Master Sashiro, 53 the Kuchi Shadow Walker um, at 54. That makes and sense. This is like big dumb creatures. You just basically, you don't know how to play with big dumb creatures. Yep. Let's clearly, be fair. Clearly I don't. Yep. <laughs> or, or the format was not conductive to big dumb creatures. Exactly. And then you have like a, a bunch of cards that are the same thing. And uh, your boy, Iron Apprentice, oh, no. is, the, is the fifth lowest uh, game in hand win rate card. Oh, However, I here, so I, I think that here, uh, this is a bit of a mathematical problem. Because you play it in very fast decks, and you play it usually probably in as many copies as you can. Yeah. And as you calculate the game in hand win rate right now, it means that if you have five of them, you draw one, uh, and you lose the game very quickly or something. Uh, you you basically had game in hand uh, whatever. Right. And um, and um, uh, in the long game that you're going to lose. Uh, you're going to draw four of them and you have a high game in hand win rate but th because the game lasted long. But for the last like seven turns of the game, you were basically trying not to lose and you lost momentum. I, so I, in the games that you lose, you're going to draw lots of them. In the games that you win, you maybe draw one and you don't draw four, which counts to the uh, uh, not drawn statistic. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. And I, I don't want to you know try to... Uh, try to... Uh, excuse this card necessarily but i i also will say i feel like in the last week specifically and you know you don't have all the data from this last week i've really got i've really been able to tune the iron apprentice red decks where i've figured out oh hey i know exactly what to do with them exactly the cards like what i wanted to pair with them i feel like maybe i was just kind of throwing them in my decks before and not prioritizing you know the uh the one three the renegade uh samurai upriser where it's like okay well i really want that and that makes the apprentice better and you know that kind of stuff so i feel like i've gotten my prowess for using the card has gotten better even in the past few days so maybe that's a small defense towards it <laughs> it makes sense yeah i was always surprised that you were not uh, using the upriser samurai but i never remember the name of the card so i was yeah <laughs> i was quiet in the chat because i didn't feel like googling it and uh, there is also colossal sky turtle and geothermal kami in those cards that um uh have relatively low game and hand win rate mm -hmm. uh, at 55.7, 55.6. Um, but it's just slightly lower than the than the win rate that they have uh, in the games. Yeah, I, I, I oh. do think a little bit with all these green cards too, which, which you know, I think 
I think I probably, they do underperform my hands a little bit, but I also think some of these numbers might come from that awkward phase where I was still trying to draft green unsuccessfully, where it's like, all right, well now I can't do this anymore. And I had, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 drafts where it's just like, yeah, I had to put these bad green cards or green cards that aren't very good in my deck, uh, you know, in context, right. Where uh, in some decks are good, Jill or Mikami for sure. But in some decks it's like, Oh, I just have to play that here. And that's not very good. So that, that might be mm. a little bit of that too. And then you have a bunch of cards that are at like 59 to 61% win rate, which I don't want to focus on because I know that your benchmark is 63.6, but I think that it's still pretty decent win rates for those cards. And uh, it would be unfair to call them poor. Uh, they are just maybe at the lower end of your uh, of your spectrum because, um, well, the decks that they were put in are maybe the decks that you win slightly less with. And it's more dependent, again, on the, on the power of the deck than on the actual power of the card. Right. But um, the six cards that we mentioned before, the Tanuki, Tales of Masters, Sashiro, the Kuchi Shadow Walker, the dumb big beasts, as I said. And also, <laughs> I mean, Geothermal Kami and Colossal Sky Turtle sort of count as uh, uh, exactly that, even though they do have some secondary functionalities. And the Iron Apprentice Aki Ember Keeper package uh, in, in Mono Red uh, that looks to be performing, well, slightly below the, but no, well below uh, your average. Yeah. All right. Now we have the last one. The improvement uh, when drawn. Which card do you think improved your deck the most when you drew them in terms of win rate? The one that springs to mind is Clawing Torment for me because I know every time I draw that, I'm like, oh, that's great here. That's amazing. Every no, 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 time Alex, I... you, you, you know what you should answer as the as the as 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 as, as uh, after after the last lesson. Trang Tra Tra Tranquil Tra Cove, right? <laughs> Tra Tra <laughs> Tranquil Cove. Okay, okay. That's got to be the number one. That's got to be the number one. Okay, clearly. I mean, I don't think I don't, I don't remember if it's number one, but I'm I'm pretty sure that this uh, it's there and about. It's up there. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I should that should have been the one that was uh, fresh in my mind. So I'll, I will I will uh, you know I will put that one for sure. But then a few. Well, in torment, yeah, is the another one. Yeah. Okay. Torment. Which torment. other card do you, you you should put based on our previous discussions here? Okay, let's think. Let's let's actually use some critical thinking here, Alex. Uh oh, now I've forgotten. So what's the next one? Um, what was the next top one? Uh, I want to say Reckoner Raid, but that's just because I've said it before. <laughs> You'll have to remind me what was up there. <laughs> Oh, well, let's. Why don't we find out? Yeah, let's do it. That, let's do it. Let's uh, that do it. Both of our brains are probably slowly deteriorating. Uh, I think so. But it is Azusa's oh, many wow. journeys. Wow, yeah. that's amazing! Holy crap! Yeah, maybe that's why you um, uh, uh, you should prioritize this card because this card seems to solve a lot of problems in uh, your green decks. Yeah, clearly. Judging by this uh, win rate uh, clearly. shift. Huh. And you know, Tranquil Cove second place. You know, obviously that that that's a very good gain. One life, um, get white mana, save the samurai from being cycled. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, Long Reach of the Night was another card that was uh, on and on and on uh, appearing in those lists of top um, uh, performance in your hands. Um, so that also is uh, improving your uh, um, win rate when you draw it. And again, I will stress that this card is tricky to play, and I think that you will excel in that kind of uh, card, especially when you... I'm pretty sure you played a lot of it in the Ninja period. Yes, that you had. Sure. And then I think that in the Ninja decks, this card can be... It's just like, oh, how many times can I sacrifice a creature or discard a card? Yeah. It's like it's like this annoying big brother of the virus beetle and the uh, <laughs> grave lighter, basically. Yeah. Uh, modern age behold the unspeakable i guess that that shows how important those cards are for the archetypes that play them um and suit up again that must be the ninja part of the uh period so the all these cards improve your win rate when you draw them from the from the benchmark when you don't uh by around nine to seven percentage points any cards that you find particularly surprising here well you know it was very low on one of the other graphs uh we do have Jukai Preserver as... Oh, is this... Wait, this is the 4-4 still? Or I look at the 4-4 and the, the, the 2... No, the, the, the 4-4 was actually decent. It was the 2-2 two -two that was low. Ah, uh, okay. Was, oh, oh really? Oh, so okay. I see. So, yeah, yeah. So, so that doesn't It was the trainee that wasn't low. I got, I got I'm, mixed I'm, up then. I'm just going to go back and, and, and check, check, check with my, me, me very eyes. Uh, because it was in the game played, uh, I think. Yeah, Jukai Trainee was there quite low. And game and hand win rate... I think preservers was just out of the list, so it was not there gotcha. in the game of hands win rate. Yeah, that's actually one of the big dumb creatures that um, 
that were not on those bottom performers. So gotcha. uh, there is something about the Juke Preserver that makes it stand out among its uh, dumb beast peers. And Harmonious Emergence. I think that this is the sort of answer, what kind of top end you want in your green decks. Yep. Preserver and uh, Emergence. Oh, yeah, Emergence is one that sticks out to me a little bit, which which is interesting. I'm not exactly sure how to explain. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the rest of them do make sense, though, and especially because they're ones that we've seen uh, quite a few times already, I would, I would say, in other places. But yeah. Uh, you know what? I think that uh, it might be something to do with how you played the format and uh, your green period was at the beginning, and I'm pretty sure you were not in Harmonious Emergence in the first 100 games. That's true. That's true. And then you... Played it mainly, and when you developed as a uh, when you drafted green, you knew that you want to be in green. Yep, that's true. And that might be the reason. But yeah, suit up a card that didn't appear anywhere else, but it seems like it's a, an essential in your ninja period, uh, even though the win rates might not be like top of the top. But I'm pretty sure it's a solid playable. Right, almost there. Bottom. <laughs> Which cards were more of a ballast than the star of your deck? Uh... Which cards? And I think that there's five or six of them that are particularly uh impacting your uh win rate when you draw them so i'm probably gonna go to iron apprentice again uh those kind of cards that the, the the red aggro cards generally have low iwds for the reason you know the math reason you were saying so yeah maybe yeah, that exactly. uh maybe the aki ember keeper uh, what else though what else is a card that i go huh really wish i didn't draw that one here um, i think I, I would say i would say four and you already nailed two of them, four that are really like um, dropping, and the rest is sort of like middling to uh, not great. Yeah, so those two, I would say, um, maybe Simeon Sling. No, Simeon Sling is not so bad when you when you uh, in those decks. I mean, okay. yeah, I guess let, I'm, I'm not sure. Let, let, okay, let, let let let's get your let's get your um, uh, answers now. So Iron Apprentice, as you said, yeah, the Kuchi Shadow Walker, which Shadow I think Walker, that um, yep. Again, the same. Only called Anvil. That's the interesting. Card. Wow. But mind you, mind you, this card had an insane gameplay's win rate. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was in very good decks, but when you drew it, you didn't win as much as you did when you didn't draw it. That's very because I think it's sort of like it's wasn't that in your podcast that was slightly off plan for the white for the black red or was it in your stream recently? I heard it somewhere. I think yeah. But sometimes so you... it's just sometimes you just don't want to. It's a grindy card, and often my... So I think if you have a base black deck with some red, Anvil is good, because that helps you. You're like more of a grindy deck. But if you're base red with some black, you don't really want to play this like inevitability engine sort of. You just want to play cards that make them dead faster. And now it's very good when they're at 8 life and you play it, and it's the one of the cards you draw later in the game. But uh, when you have it in your opening hand, I don't think it's very good. So... Like that you know, if it was like Approach of the Second Sun, that every game I started, it's my exactly seventh card uh, from the top of the library after I drew my opening hand. Yeah. I would love that card because yes. that's probably where you want to... If you don't kill them in five turns, you want to draw it. But you might be don't want to have it in your opening hand because that sort of stops you from killing them in those five turns that you would prefer. Totally. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I, I definitely... I uh, agree with that. Also, that's one that we haven't talked about. Uh, Tales of Masters Eshiro that's come up a few times. That mm, I feel yeah, like... and not in a good way. Yeah, not in a good way. This is the card that I, you know, everybody has one of these cards in the format. No, I can never win with it, and my opponents always beat me with it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, mean, I, I usually play it, put a counter on something, they kill the creature, I miss with the second chapter, and then when it untaps, they just put the Intercessor's Arrest on it or something. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, exactly. And you know, it's 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 so funny because in the end, it, it's not that terribly different from um, uh, Harmonious Emergence, but somehow Harmonious Emergence is just perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love the card <laughs> and its performance. I mean, you know, well. I mean, yeah. And and I mean, I think that below that uh, Unstoppable Ogre, uh, I think that those results are just not worth mentioning because again, they are very very small difference in in terms of gameplay game. Uh, games in hand uh win rates so right. you know we don't want the we we don't want to bash the colossal sky turtle more than, than necessary i think two percentage points difference that it shows here is is not too much so that's fine all right right let's go for some conclusions so yeah. um 
<laughs> so I, I'm actually because I never done it. It's, you, as I said, you're you're the guinea pig here. But uh, did you find that kind of introspective at the end of the season? Um, interesting, informative. Do you find? Uh, did you find anything like uncomfortable and uh, learning some? You know, like getting contradicted on some things when you say something and then the data shows up. Right. That it was the opposite. Does it feel like weird or? So a little bit, I would say I, I'm definitely somebody who, well, I'm of two minds here because I definitely, I don't care so much about being right for myself, but since I do say these things to other people, I want to be truthful as best truth as much as I can possibly be. And if I've said this thing multiple times and then there's maybe something that contradicts it, I like, well, I've led this, these people astray. You know, I don't mind being at all being wrong myself. I actually think, you know, I, I don't mind at all, but um, there's a little bit of that. Now I don't think there's too many things here that I felt like, ah, oh, I really messed some people's drafts up because of these things. I said, I don't think anything like that happened today, but there's always a little bit of that in general where, where uh, if I feel like I sent something early in a format, uh, and then the data at 17 lands comes and it goes, oh, you know, that, uh, that actually shows that card's not very good, you know. So a little bit, but overall, no, 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 I think this was fantastic. I loved it. I was very excited. You know, I wasn't uh, playing it up when I said I'm very excited to see the cards that I do poorly with because I think that's super interesting. Honestly, I'm, you know, I am somebody who looks at 17 lands data quite a bit. And it was very, very interesting to see just how big of a difference certain cards were in my hands versus, uh, you know, the average player either more or less you know below or above them so that that is uh something that i mean i hope at some point like you were mentioning other people can experience as well but i, I thought it was great so um uh, yeah i mean just a caveat of course because the win rate data are, of alex only are based on much smaller sample sizes there might be variance that plays a role there so don't take this as a written in stone kind of analysis <laughs> yeah i think that you know like the the data from your win rate evolu uh, evolution over the uh, format and the changes in your color usage these ones are the ones that i would trust the most in in in, in this data set the card win rate, it's interesting to see because if a card repeats itself time after time after time, then you can see something in there. But when you see like a one-off uh, that, that's slightly weird, maybe maybe that's just a piece of variance, like with the Tranquil Cove, for example. Right, yeah. Which I still think, I mean, good good card and useful probably in some decks, but not necessarily like, you know, this was clearly not the best card in your uh, <laughs> that you have drafted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But... What do you have like any ideas of the top of your hand of the data that you might be interesting to learning about yourself, but I didn't talk about? Not at the top of my head. The one thing that I was thinking that it's not that you didn't talk about this, but I wonder if there's some way to integrate this based on uh, season performance and, uh, you know, just like where you do the overlay of my win rates versus what I was drafting. One of the questions I get asked a lot and I don't have an amazing answer to, I have an approximation of an answer and I can point people certain places, but it's always, if I'm not in tune with the meta, how do I follow this nebulous meta thing that Alex and some of their content creators always talk about, you know? And I think if you could get from, you know, people like me who play a lot, kind of early trends and seeing maybe where things overlap or, oh, uh, these players had very great success with these decks when everybody was drafting this. I think that's some sort of something people would be very interested in. Um, other than that, I, from the, from this, I, I can't think of anything that you didn't cover. Like, you were very thorough, as always. <laughs> so I don't think there's anything off the top of my head, no. Well, I, just, I just dumped the whole truckload because, yeah. <laughs> because I, I, I don't have the power in me of, 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 of selecting something. And maybe maybe it was even too much in some cases. And which of these data sets that we are talking about would you personally find most useful as a 17 lens user to have access to on your profile page? I think just the, the game at hand win rate would probably like that, that's the gold standard that we always point people towards. So I think just having that as this is yours compared to the, the rest of the people. Cause I think that's the one, you know, if I had to guess, that is the thing that when people use 17 lands uh, to look at, data not to look at their own games but to look at the aggregate mm. data that is the main thing they're looking at so i think it'd be great to see that as you know comparing to you know their own personal data compared to that aggregate number you you see displayed now okay yeah i mean obviously the problem with that is that it, you wouldn't get the numbers until quite mid true yeah yeah even, yeah, that's even true, for yeah. someone like you because then i mean and it will come i mean we probably could you know put the preliminary numbers and uh, with a bunch of asterisks that uh, <laughs> yeah look there can be a quite a large, you know, seven percentage point uh, error on this one, which uh, which means it's 
somewhere it's 50 percent, but it's somewhere between 57 and 43 which might, might deter some people or right um, even misinform them right my last question is are, do you have it in you to have a couple of questions from the chat <laughs> yeah i'm mean, sure if the chat's got questions Go I, on I, then. I, uh, well I'm... then chat maybe you can maybe uh, maybe we can take I was ignoring it very carefully because normally I take the questions during the seminar, but I thought with two of us already here, it would be super awkward to also answer uh, <laughs> the question as, uh, yeah. Yeah, if Chad, I'm, I'm gonna- No, they just all disappeared. They don't want to know anything more from you. <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure. I'll, uh, I'll go get some water and then if we have questions- Oh yeah, go, hydrate. Back? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that went well. <laughs> I honestly never did a stream when I'm the actual host and someone is a guest. So um, while we wait for Alex to hydrate, I mean, any questions would be good, uh, especially, especially to Alex, obviously. Okay, well, that's small sam in a second I will, I will i'll put it on the screen when alex comes back but i have your question that's a very good one but for the for the youtube people there we go i also imagine there might not be too many because like i said you were so very you see th this is th this is this is the question I, it should be on the screen oh great small oh wow very very quick very snappy <laughs> uh small sam says, how is Alex going to incorporate this information into his future drafts? Well, so like I was saying, as somebody who does look at the 17 lands data a lot, the cards, I kind of see cards stick out impacts to me almost as like, I remember the number, right? The, the game in hand win rate number. And those kind of, it's almost like you're as if you were virtually thumbing through a pack, I would thumb those to the front, right? And uh, they have, I would say, a pretty strong pull towards what I wanted, what I choose to pick out of the pack. And uh, you know, just as there are cards that I choose to pick out of the pack strong, you know, uh, early and often because they have high game hand rate weights, there is the opposite as well, where it's like, oh, I don't like that card very much because, you know, the aggregate data says it's not very good. Now, I believe that now that I have my own personalized data of what I perform well with and what I don't perform well with, I will probably take that more to heart a little bit than just the aggregate data. I think that just makes more sense. So, you know, when I see the Asuzas or when I see the Long Reacher Knight, it's funny, Long Reacher Knight's a good one. Because that's when I, I, my brain was actually telling me, ah, do I still like this card? I don't know about that. I, I, I uh, maybe even influenced a little bit because it has dipped a little bit as the format's going on through 17 lands data. But clearly, maybe I, I make use of it in a way that, you know, I can play it well, like you said. So I think uh, it's almost like my own personalized numbers that I'll have to adjust for. All right. The second question is maybe more to me about how many drafts would a player need before this data becomes truly valuable? I mean... Obviously, in the perfect world, you probably want like 300 drafts. But I think that at 60 drafts, you might get some valuable information about commons. And uh, at around uh, Alex's uh, numbers, or maybe you know 120 or something drafts, you will get uh, pretty valuable information about the uncommons. So that's that's there. Uh, now another question is to Alex. Looking at the data, how does Alex foresee his card evaluation adjusting, especially when thinking about Alex's evaluation of Neo going into it? Yeah, so hmm, this is a good question. So I think yeah, I touched on this already, but especially my evaluations of Neo going into it. Well, I mean, I think this probably like you're saying with the big dumb creatures. Um, I, I I do tend to have a bias against big dumb creatures, expensive cards in general, and potentially this is because I maybe and I would be interested to see over multiple formats. Uh, don't play with them as well as maybe some people do. Maybe I you know. Uh, in, in a bit uh, too aggressive with my life total in the beginning of the game, and that makes me uh, not be able to stabilize and have my 6-6 six, six with an ability takeover or whatever it is, right? So potentially, let's say for the next set of evaluation or card, uh, card review, set, set review, that's what I'm looking for, <laughs> with Ethan, uh, maybe I give a little bit of a nudge to, yeah, that card's expensive, but Maybe it's pretty like for example, a colossal sky troll is a card that I remember I was like not so into, and I do think actually it's a bit overrated to be honest. But uh, I remember during the set review, I was like, yeah, you know what? It's expensive. It's got, it's got some other modes, but I think people are gonna overrate this card, right? 
probably if I'm my best, uh, the best interests of you know the people watching and people I'm providing the content to, it's probably best to understand that I have those biases both in my own evaluation and how I use the card and say, hey, this I should probably talk this card up just a little bit more and talk about the places it's good, even though maybe for me it's not as good. Hmm. I mean, I, I I completely disagree. How can a giant turtle in the sky be not so good? <laughs> yeah, but okay, exactly. I digress. Um, this is a sort of linked question uh, from Singularity26. Does this information feel like it's actionable for future formats for you? Hmm. I think so. What do you think? <laughs> I, I mean, I think yes is my simple, straightforward answer, but yeah. I think that the, 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 the one thing that I thought would be actionable is like combining your well-known uh, deprioritizing of removal with your great results with some particular types of removal here. I thought it was an interesting part. Yeah, that yeah, I think would so merit too. some action. I think so too. Uh, you're just, just Alex, you're no longer an aggro player. You're a tempo player. Yeah, no, it's true. You know what? That actually might be true. I, th I think I do have a very good sense of tempo. Although, you know, through years of content creation, I still couldn't define it for you if you asked me on the spot. But nobody can, so that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that is that is an interesting point. I, I'd, I'd be interested in, in doing a bit of soul searching on my own to see what that means. Uh, you know, my my relative, uh, the the relative. High high performance I have with uh, the removal spells, uh, at least those those specific ones or particular ones I should say. Okay, uh, this is the, again more for me. Is it possible to see this for the past format? You can't even see it for the current format as the individual data. This is a trial, and uh, Alex is the first person on the planet that had their individual <laughs> data from seventeen lands uh, fully analyzed and uh, looked through. Uh, so thanks for volunteering about it. But uh, oh, we're nice. hoping to make something that will be uh, available for every user. Uh, tuck, 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 tuck. Um, would data including variance over time of all these stats graphed with the rolling average with defined time range, 10 day, 10 day average, etc. Oh, so you want to do it rather than uh, over games than over time. I prefer to link it with the number of games and then put it still on the time um, axis because um, I think that I want to have the window being the same size. And if you have days, you will have a couple of days you didn't play and the window will be much smaller. So it will increase the variance. So, uh, yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, this graph is particularly useful for uh, people that play a bunch because then they can try to trace it with quite a large precision. Uh, what do you think? I, I, I uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what do you think, Alex? Because I had just this idea. Imagine that. We get the individual data for players, for individual cards, the win rates. Then the streamers volunteer to be in the uh, leaderboards for each card. Oh. And then you can pick which streamer is the best Imperial Oath player, by the way. <laughs> I um, like it. <laughs> which streamer is the best red uh, uh, aggro uh, player? Can you imagine like using 17 lands to sort of promote streamers if you're interested in the particular aspect of the game? That's cool. Yeah, no, that that is really cool. I feel like that sounds, I mean, from my end, at least, that sounds complex, but I'm sure for you, you have it worked out in your I head. I mean, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm as ignorant about how those things operate. Okay, as you yeah, are. you're I'm just saying. I'm just uh, getting yeah. a file and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and getting the data in totally. my own way, but how to get it on the website, I, it's beyond me, but... Uh, as an idea, I think it would be quite an interesting tool for especially people that draft a lot would be interested in personal data more. And if it could, you know, sort of drive drive traffic because you can say, well, I'm officially the best Kubana faces Kakazan <laughs> drafter uh, in 17 lands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Oh, this is a question to me, clearly, because I'm a specialist in heckling Alex during the drafts uh, in the chat. Um, well, I think that you should just remind him that the um, Iron, uh, Iron Apprentice, uh, every time he picks it, uh, just remind him, are you sure, Alex? And I was, are you I, sure, Alex? There's, there is a tranquil cove in that path. <laughs> I just got, yeah, I took a Kamado into a Kami Flare, into a Voltage Surge. Alex, are you sure you want to take that on your apprentice? Like the the lay, clearly you have a better of win rate with that land. So, um, 
And then the question from Brett, uh, how about using the data to create a more accurate ranking system? Uh, so there is something like that. I mean, it's not a more accurate ranking system, but there is the leaderboard for um, uh, for 17 lands. I think that there can be still a bit work done there to maybe make the win rate leaderboards more for the people that play a huge volume of games. Because right now, you know, you compare people that played 40 games with people that played 400 games and uh, the win rates are slightly different. Um, but I do think that the ranking system is broken and not transparent and i would be very happy uh, for arena to change it rather than to create something on top of their broken system because people that uh, do it as a hobby can do a better job than a multi-billion dollar company which would be uh, it's, it's 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 awkward but i do I, I i i do have an idea of making a ranking uh the problem is that um 17 lens doesn't have enough users to make the ranking precise if everyone would be using 17 lens no problem. We could probably roll out a better ranking system within a week, but because um, because only a couple of percent of players use it, uh, that becomes tricky. Um, uh, yes, that's been done. One ball was. Um, it's basically. Um, you can normalize it and it's being done now in the tables you got a much smaller impact of cards that uh, were drawn in multiples because of the changing of the calculation of the win rates so basically uh partially because of um because of ninjutsu uh the way that the thing is calculated right now has been changed uh, early in kamigawa and um, it's been updated now it works slightly better No. <laughs> Hi to that cubed. Uh, you wanted to filter by win rate against mythic only. I, I think that um, it's an interesting proposition, but I would say that you can play a very good player in silver and it doesn't matter. I just think that it's just not fair to compare win rates of people that play 20 games in gold versus people that play 400 games in mythic. Yeah, that's true. But I think that the volume should sort it because you cannot stay with a high win rate in uh, silver because you obviously going to progress to the next category so all right i mean i think that um it's been pretty long but you want to go you want to go a little bit longer I, i've got a little bit <laughs> alex you have it in your tank but remember i'm 40 I, it's my, past my <laughs> bedtime I, I i need to remove my false teeth put them in the <laughs> glass next to the bed uh, read uh, readers digest and go to sleep or something like that. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, you know, apart from those fifteen seconds we had yesterday when we tested the system, which by the way worked surprisingly well. I have yes, to say. very I'm, smooth, I'm, uh, the, very smooth. The stream streamyard uh, works. I think I'm going to use it more frequently, especially that it, it's sort of free and you can run it in your browser for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I might use um, it as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being brave enough to be at a, a, a hopefully not a complete crash, but a crash test, um, and hopefully not the dummy, but a crash test dummy. Um, again, for all of you that don't know Alex, uh, please do uh, <laughs> uh, learn a lot about it. I am one of the most prolific uh, uh, stream watchers of Alex. I, I listen to every single episode of um, Alex's podcast i do remember when i first heard alex's podcast it was at manchester airport waiting for a plane Aww. i was still in the abram years i remember it vividly yes. because you know with abram i had this thought like oh why am i listening to a 13 year old and then my second thought was well but because that 13 year old <laughs> made a bunch of good gp finishes and also the alex guy seems to know what they are talking about so yeah <laughs> well it's, um, it's funny you mentioned that because i i actually remember the first time I remember I was the first time you reached out to us saying that exact thing. <laughs> I remember you yeah. just on Twitter and I was like, oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, um, well, now you're flying solo, but maybe, uh, maybe everyone at some stage will return. Uh, as the Pro Tour is back. Can Anything can happen. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but please do listen to Alex. Also, if you have some uh, Prime and uh, uh, any pocket change, please do uh, support him because he's a full time streamer and. Uh, we want to keep our full-time streamer streaming full-time um, <laughs> as his um, media empire is slowly growing. Yes. <laughs> um, 
But I also have a couple of people to thank for um, in terms of preparation for this. I would like to especially thank Virus Misnomer, who um, spent some of his personal time to generate me the data set that contained only Alex because I don't have access to personal data. I have to uh, ask because obviously 17 Lens likes to protect the uh, personal information. And unless you agree to something like Alex did, we will not fish out your personal data and uh, uh, and, and publish it in any way. Uh, so thank him for that. And obviously Hululu and Grant Wu and um, uh, Pekka Puli and, um, and Ale Alexander, Alessandro Ballini. Uh, these are the people that are now uh, helping with, um, uh, with the smooth sailing of the 17 lands. And I would really like to thank Fake Jake Brown, uh, AKA Uncle Cardboard, because he helped me setting up the stream. He uh, publishes the podcast version of it because I'm, I'm a dumb technology person. So uh, he really does quite a lot of uh, uh, work behind the scenes for this. And uh, I pay him zero because uh, why would I? Uh, so at least I can give him a thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I guess with that, Alex, I hopefully will uh, hear from you at some later stage, uh, maybe in a similar capacity. Well, I, um, I will say before we leave, thank you so much for bringing me on. This was a, a pleasure and a treat and, you know, all the hard work you've done i i mean you you're thanking me but i should be thanking you you're the one who's catering to you know using my data and you're showing me some cool new information so i i you know thank you for this and everything you do for sure oh yeah i also will give you an opportunity to plug one of your many ventures because uh because you should you know better what what your current ventures are i got lost with the 12 12 one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, you mentioned, but uh, I do a lot. Well, let's see. So I've got the, the stream. Everything you can, you know, if you just search cord underscore O underscore calls, C-H in the cord, uh, you'll find my stream, my Twitter. There's also limited level ups, like you mentioned, the podcast I do every week. Um, there's also CFB articles. I also do some coaching in there. And now there's a limited level ups YouTube that I post draft videos there, too. So basically every single kind of content you can imagine I make for magic for, for draft. So, yep. <laughs> also, I mean, I'm sure you're going to do a set review for the streets of New Capena. And yes. this is the set review I would recommend to anyone because this is the one that I listen to usually multiple times. Oh, yeah, I, I recommend. And usually after the season, just to make fun of Alex in the chat. But that's a different That's also story. good. Yeah, that's also good. I'm sure <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I have uh, some funny things to say. Actually, no, I, I was I was good about Imperial Oath. I like that card. But there was many, many misses this go around. Zenith Flare. Zenith Flare. Yeah, Zenith Flare. Zenith Flare is probably my biggest <laughs> offender. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, with that, let's, uh, let's give a bit of a rest to our uh, yes, voices. Uh, but that. thank you very much for coming, Alex. And uh, thank you all for listening. Also, for the ones that, uh, of you that listen to this in the podcast version, thanks to SSQ and uh, Mana Junkie for the music that I'm using in my intro and outro. Um, and with that, I won't see you next week because I'm going on a holiday, but I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>